luxury sedan, electric or internal combustion engine? That is the question here for today with our big comparison episode. And we are comparing the new BMW 7 Series versus the BMW i7 and the Mercedes S-Class versus the Mercedes EQS together with the Genesis G80 versus the Genesis G80 EV. This is a very interesting episode because we have three examples where the electric version is heading against the internal combustion engine version. So with 7 Series and i7, they are basically a very same vehicle, just with different powertrain. The same counts for the G80 and the G80 EV. Still, they have some differences besides the powertrain. And with the Mercedes, the S-Class is really different from the EQS. So they are two separate vehicles, also on two separate platforms. How is this going to play out? Let's find out. Let's go. Is this the new king of luxury? The Chinese manufacturers are pushing to the premium and luxury market. Mercedes has presented the EQS. Now BMW says, hold my Bavarian beer, we can do better. But is it true? Can this all new BMW 7 Series, including the electric i7, be even better than Bentley or Rolls Royce? We're going to find out together here with Thomas on Autogefühl for you. This one here you can see in the two-tone paint, 12,000 euros or dollars extra. You have the black on the top and here, for example, the Aventurine red on the lower part. Different color combinations are available. Throughout this review, we'll show you different colors and both the petrol and the electric version will also solve the question, petrol or electric, what is better, especially here in the luxury segment. Huge double kidney here. Very impressive. In the extended shadow line, you can get it in all black, but you could also get it in a more subtle note. Here, for example, in the two-tone paint, I think there's a transition between the top paint and the grill, which is not ideal, I think. Oh, what's your take? Slim integration of the daytime running lights in the top and this split here. That was highly criticized by a lot of viewers as well, that you have the split between the daytime running light and the real headlamp unit. So I would like to hear your take on the front design here of the 7 Series in the new generation. G70 is the internal code. Join us in the comments. Let's go with the rest. 5 meters 39 or 212 inches is the length of the all new BMW 7 Series. Of course, that counts for all the versions, no matter which powertrain you pick. And the interesting thing is that if you consider some of the competitors like a Mercedes EQS or a Neo ET7 or a Tesla Model S, this one here is indeed way longer and they are pushing in that Bentley or Rolls Royce direction. Rolls-Royce is of course belonging to the BMW Corporation and Rolls-Royce doesn't want to hear that. But we can show you some features today that it's actually true that they are pushing even more up market. It will only be available in this long wheelbase version. So far they had to split, for example, in Germany, more short wheelbase. In the US the long wheelbase was standard. They say now this is the world car has just one rebase. Makes it simpler, simpler for us, definitely. You see, I also dress in two-tone paint today, but I refuse to wear a red, well, well, wine red trousers for that one. Um, but you can see here, it's not only that split. Here, there's another line for that. So it is very, very complicated to use this paint here in the process. That's why it's so expensive. Me personally, I'm more team one tone, so one single paint, but are you Team 2 paint, also leave me then your comments. Wheels from 19 to 22 inch. These here are already big ones, 21 inch, somewhat still a compromise. Suspension, there will always be adaptive air suspension as standard. An optional, there is a so-called driver's package. And this then gives you rear axle steering, anti-roll stabilization, so an even sporty effect and also better in turning around, turning circle, narrow parking, and so on and so on. So this will also play a major effect. And now very interesting from the drag coefficient, 0.24 here for the BMW 7 Series or i7. And this is worse than some of the competitors because here usually they go for a raindrop design. But BMW more upright, more space also for the headroom and so on because they did not go for the raindrop design, rather German Bauhaus, a little bit more upright, and they did some small tweaks for the wind efficiency. You can see it, for example, also right there. So a lot of work in the wind tunnel. But the question is, 
is it still very efficient, although they are a little bit worse than the competition in the drag coefficient, but it also has then, you can see here, higher trunk, more space uh, in the rear and so on. So this has more advantages as for this, especially the luxury sedan segment. Soon, of course, more about the range for the i7 when we drive it, and of course, this comparison petrol versus electric. Here in the rear, the tail lamps are horizontally drawn, very modern, but still, I prefer actually that this does not look this raindrop alike and say like, oh, this is only about wind efficiency. So a very strong designer also. And yeah, in this case then also with a two-tone paint here in the lower part. However, <whistles> fake exhaust police here on Autogefühl because yeah, these are tips then the real exhaust on the inside. It's really hard to get it focused here on camera, this detail, this extra strip. And I just wanted to show you when I touch this here, this transition, you can feel no transition at all. This is all perfectly smooth. So incredible paint job. And can you see that? This crystalline structure and in the inside of the data mine lights here on this top part here. This is such an attention to detail. And indeed, never before there were so many interesting details with the 7 Series. And this generation is so much different from the predecessor, also almost like never before. And this vehicle here is deep frozen gray in the color, a matte dark gray color, almost, I would say it's almost matte black, isn't it? But they call it deep frozen gray. Yeah, this finally now fits my outfit even better. And this is also the i7, by the way. But you can pick this color, of course, also for the petrol engine. Where do you see from the exterior if it's the EV or the petrol or maybe also diesel in Europe or the plug-in? Well, the thing is here, the electrified models here have the blue ring around the BMW logo. And that's basically it. The rest, if you want here the double kidney in black with a frame here, again, extended shadow line also on this one, two-tone paint and so on. You decide that on your own, you decide it yourself. It's just, they are more in the strategy, hey, we don't want the EV to look different. That's the 7 Series, and you can pick it in the engine version or the motor version you like. Very interesting approach. What do you think about that? And also at the rear here, the one thing you can see, we have the blue ring here around the BMW logo to differentiate it, and we also have the i7 logo right here. Once again, extended shadow line with blacked out rear lamps for, for more sinister look. So yeah, this looks really massive, doesn't it? Here it says X-Drive 60. That's the first version of the i7. It is also all-wheel drive, one electric motor in the front, one electric motor in the rear. The acceleration figure is 4.7 seconds to one kilometer or 62 miles an hour. That's half a second slower than the V8. However, later there will be the M70 version of the i7 which will then be the quickest version of all of the whole lineup. They will also then have some hardware changes to the rear electric motor. Very interesting. The top speed for this one already 240 kilometers an hour or 150 miles an hour. So it's not really much slower than the petrol version. They go a little bit faster, but yeah, I think we can easily live with that even in Germany on the German Autobahn. We also have two more colors for you today, by the way, the oxide gray. Is that also gray? I'm not sure, but it looks really interesting. And also the mineral white that works very well also with contrasts, for example. Which color would you go for? I'm still looking forward to see one in Thomas Blue, of course. But I mean, these matte colors they offer here are also very striking. So which one is petrol? Which one is EV? Can you tell? Let me tell you. Left side is the petrol one, right side the EV. You just see the blue ring around the logo. And here with this vehicle, we have a very dark, elegant blue vehicle color. That's cool. And this one, as you can obviously see, has the illuminated double kidney. And the option is called Iconic Glow. And you have this outline then there and also welcoming function when you approach the vehicle. And as another option, there are also this Swarovski crystals option. <laughs> and this you can also see here at these headlamps. We also have our other vehicle. This is the thing where, as, where you always can see these, these special details, you know, how they are worked out this top part of the data mining light. Let's take a look at the turning indicators or hazard lights here, in this case on both sides. That looks also pretty special here in the front, right? But also at the rear and also in the interior. Let's take a look. The US spec version has the red 
turning indicators. Of course, then for example, European spec one where the yellow turning indicators would look a little bit more distinctive. Yeah, look at that, the ambient lighting. Woo, hazard light, <laughs> ambient lighting. Haven't seen that. What a great idea, right? It's, you know, it's just initially and then it turns off by the, yeah, but probably when you are somewhere having it on for a longer time that you don't get annoyed by it, but that's pretty special, isn't it? And also when you approach the vehicle from the rear, it's some kind of welcoming signature. That's really impressive. And look at that interior light at night. Even more impressive than in this case. And when you open the vehicle, you also get some kind of welcoming display. And then also the ambient lighting becomes more obvious. But even when you close the vehicle again, even from the outside, when the doors are closed, it looks really amazing. And when you get away from the vehicle again, at some point, it closes off and then also says goodbye with this signature. The smartphone app offers some cool features. For example, if you have the automatic doors, then you can also open the doors via the smartphone. And that looks very impressive, especially when you open them all four at once. And what you can also do is use the remote parking function. So we know it maybe from Hyundai, Kia and Genesis that they do it with the key fob here, also with BMW, with the smartphone app. And then you can also ease your car out of parking lots or put them in when they're very narrow. Before we get to the interior, let's quickly take a look at the powertrains. This one here, the pure petrol version, this is the 4.4 liter V8 with 540 horsepower in the 760i. So the strongest petrol engine, 4.2 seconds is the acceleration figure. And then there will also be the 3 liter inline six cylinder pure petrol engine. This one will also be totally sufficient, 5.4 seconds is the acceleration figure there. However, the pure petrol engines are for the US market and some other countries, Northern America in general is the main market for that one. In Europe, we don't get the pure petrol engine, but we get the diesel. What is it? It's kind of a trade-off BMW, huh? <laughs> well, but for all markets, you get the plug-in hybrid based on the 3 liter inline six cylinder petrol engine and the i7, the pure electric version. If you need some extra foot room, this is the version to go for. I'm just kidding. This is the cutaway model here where we can see more of that battery. This is the i7 cutaway and these cells here combined make a total capacity of 102 kilowatt hours net recharging will be 10 to 80 percent state of charge charge with DC charging in 34 minutes. It's the optimum at the 195 kilowatt peak and here at the closed side you can also see the two-tone paint when you have the top part here in the gray or silver styling then it has even more contrast and you can see this separate fine line even better and once again no transition here or you can feel no the transition with your finger is really very very, very well made well will worth <laughs> be twelve thousand dollars or euros to you so you rather press here in this upper corner and then you move a little bit more backwards that you do not block the sensor. So when I press it here, the door does open automatically like this. And the question is, what about, you know, like the safety thing? So when I close it here from the inside again and I'll be... Well, it... Oh, it still applies pressure. Oh, a little bit. Yeah, so it, it stops, yes. But actually, it's not too pleasant, I have to say. Let me stand up and then see again. Oh. Um, yeah, so you could knock away children with that. It won't hurt so much and there won't be like a major accident. Yeah, but um, you just have to be aware of that, definitely. And the thing is also, what about from the outside? Pressing it here and then, ah, you can see, there it stops. So this is then better with the sensor so there it stops before it does hit everything. So yeah, that's the safety thing on the outside. Well, when you're on the inside, you just have to learn to control the doors a little bit better. 
inside of the doors. A lot of different materials are being used, really screaming out. Bowers and Wilkins sound system here behind that. Seat control in this crystalline look, but you can still move that thing. You get a haptic feedback, unlike with the Mercedes at the moment, with the new models. Then here, fabric with wool share. This is this kind of interior, but you would also get a uh, like a, a new uh, so-called Veganza sensor tech. Um, it's like a, a more evolved sensor tech style if you get that interior. And here, high gloss black piano lacquer. That is, I think, the least favorable material we see here at the inside of the doors. Steering wheel in a new design. This is here the M Sport steering wheel. As for the seats, this one here, the fabric wool share mix. So this is like this you know, more fabric approach to it. Why not in the luxury segment? Reducing animal skin leather already a little bit. The top part is animal origin, however. And then there's a full animal skin wrap still. And new, however, here with the new 7 Series is the so-called Veganza material. It is basically the same appearance like the new Sensor Fin in the BMW X7 facelift, only that they use different suppliers. But they are both then kind of an elaborated sensor tech material, animal-free, less resource used, less energy used, better to animals, better to the workers and so on. So this is where it is heading to, definitely. Some limitations for the Veganza material as for the market choice. In Germany, we can basically get it for all the versions. In UK, you can get it for the i7, for the all-electric version. And in the US, they make it the other way around. They don't offer the i7 with the Veganza material. And also not here the 8-cylinder. There you have to go for the 6-cylinder. I think not a good strategy to limit this offer there because the material is superb. It has also the very same durability but way less impact on everything around us. So we've seen it in the X7 it is perfect and also way to go than here when specking this vehicle. As for the comfort here when seating for the seat ergonomics, yeah it's really very comfortable, very luxurious and that's also the first thing when you take a look at the competitors. The new ED7 recently I think had also good comfort in seating. Tesla Model S and Mercedes EQS, they are this one here, has definitely way more comfort already when sitting in the front here. So for the seat ergonomics here and how you feel, this is one of the most luxurious sedans definitely. And yeah, I mean, from the comfort in the front, they can easily, I think even be better than Bentley or Rolls Royce. So you feel with everything they do here, they are pushing towards the segment. However, user interface you've already seen, they're getting more and more digital. Is that the right thing to do? We'll also tell you more about that. Interior overview, well, very clean first impression and told you, <laughs> Mercedes EQS is all about ambient lighting. BMW says, hold my beer. We can also do ambient lighting and that's where we ended up with. So here, this is really amazing. So this uh, yeah, crystalline structure on the top. It's not glass though that would have been you know not really crash safe and here you can then switch through the different colors and i mean it's really bright it's 12 o'clock noon at the moment here and you can still very well see that so that's actually a pretty cool idea to bring more spice to the interior however as for the vents control if we take a closer look right here um, this is also digitalized and do you see here this you know, this green dot jumping. This looks a little bit more like Space Invaders or so, <laughs> isn't it? Here on the driver and the co-driver side, by the way, it's the same. You can see the transition here between the door inside panel and this cockpit panel, how the ambient lighting is changing. So yeah, once again, especially at night, that's a very impressive feature. You still have buttons you can really press here, for example, for the cruise control. This is like one button but then the central one is separated. Digital instruments, left side speed, right side here the RPM, boom, boom. <laughs> and then you can also change what you want to see in the middle. You can have here the music view from the CarPlay. You can have the GPS, car internal GPS, but it's also possible to show Apple Maps here or Google Maps with Android Auto. And ah, there we go, this is the front view camera. It's also a nice integration. Then you can also change the whole layout if you rather prefer, for example, this or this, um, yeah, or maybe this, yeah. And you can also have just a central uh, speed in the middle if you want it rather reduced. Head display also with more elaborated view. 
it is always more crisp in real life than it is on camera. Um, yeah, I'll we'll also see more about it when we drive the vehicle. Now the infotainment system here, the temperature always stays in the lower part. I do prefer manual climate knobs, you know that, but this one, at least it stays here, but not a real progress, I would think. Climate menu, you can also now turn on and off the AC function. They upgraded that, and here, for example, is the seat cooling and the seat heating and steering wheel heating. Very important for winter time. This is my favorite winter time car function, actually. Then here, there's also a main menu available like this, but I think OS 8 is overkill. I did prefer OS 7. This one, of course, has just so many more functions overall. And yeah, I told you about the interior ambient lighting function, for example, that could can be activated right here. And the My Mode selection is also interesting. So here you pick the different driving modes and then also the ambient lighting changes accordingly and also some parameters for driving. Here in Sport Mode, for example, the bolts of the seat go a little bit more inward, for example. You can still control everything from down below, so you don't have to use the touchscreen. So you can also control the CarPlay like this. And with Auto also available, both wireless and the integration is really cool here, definitely. And this Bowers & Wilkins sound system, I can tell you, is just pleasure to listen to that one. Great song, by the way. Wow, such a great sound quality, amazing, wow. Lower middle console, this inductive charging pad here. And hard to pick it up on camera, but this is here a small slot and it is sucking away. Yeah, I did say that sucking away the air <laughs> from the smartphone, though it doesn't overheat while inductive charging. <laughs> so, and then here you have the cup holders. You can open them, slide like this, and they are also adaptive and hold bottles tight. Did I just say like in one or two sentences now, slot sucking and tight? Here again, more high gloss black piano, like I don't like it. The crystalline knob here is quite cool here, and then you can still have this, oh, sound. Da, 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 da. Yeah, that's always cool. Uh, here the GPS hotkey, for example, a home hotkey. So you still have some things to control that you're used to. This here is the shifting lever. And this is basically the only thing you can differentiate if you're driving a petrol engine or the electric version. Here D and S, and whereas in the i7, the electric one, you have D and B for the recuperation mode, actually. We have my favorite split opening like this for the middle console. Not too much space here, two USB-C chargers. And, well, BMW did not hand me over a key, but rather just a smartphone. And then you have this app here and you can lock and unlock your vehicle. Oh, they also uh, did this, you know, original two-tone paint design on there. I do prefer a normal knob. And we are also charging our camera echoes here, uh, camera batteries. Um, meanwhile, so um, yeah, it is usable, but not too much space. What about you? Would you go for the smartphone only solution? We know that Tesla customers also use that together with this key card. Or do you want to hold a real key fob in your hand? <laughs> why did the, why did Michelle's door close? So Michelle just got a hit in the <laughs> he just got hit in in the back by the door. Ah, but wait, you, you did hit the, like the automatic door button, like this one here, right? Yeah, you did hit this one with your arm or something. So you, you basically, Michelle, stop hitting yourself. Stop hitting yourself. Stop hitting yourself. <laughs> yeah, funny things like these can happen with this new digitalized interface in the vehicle. And this is always the question, you know, like, like with the key fob. I do prefer a real key fob, you know. Um, yeah, I think I'm gonna go to BMW and do a Karen. Like, I want to talk to the manager. I want a real key fob. I paid for this. <laughs> yeah, you still get the normal key fob. Yes, that's a good thing, and you can use it. But on these, you know, um, test drives, they also encourage you to use all the digital functions of the vehicle. And um, yeah, I sometimes try to keep it a little bit more, you know, down to earth as for the vehicles. So. You can still use some buttons here, um, but I'm not sure, like also with the automatic door opening and closing and so on. Rear area, before we get to the executive driving, being chauffeured position, what about when I'm sitting behind the tall driver? Yes, that's me. Here, the leg room is still sufficient. They are not making good use of the space, but there will always be enough space available. And also as for the headroom, and here's the thing that they, um, did a compromise with aerodynamics so they could still offer a lot of headroom even with one meter 89 or six for two and the comfort here if you compare it to the eqs 
is so much better indeed. So BMW clearly wins it here. And I have to say, would I need a Bentley or Rolls Royce for that and pay even more? I think really not. It is super luxurious in here indeed. And the thing is, when you have the Mercedes comparison, you have to compare this one both to the S-Class and to the EQS. And the difference in rear comfort is so huge to the EQS. S-Class also offers decent rear comfort, yes, of course. Um, but here, of course, BMW decided to have one vehicle for the both electric and the petrol version. And nothing will be different here in the interior, really. That's a very crucial point. The one thing I do criticize it with this vehicle is, but that's not only about BMW, it's about all the brands, using this vehicle has become more complicated. So I put up the shade here. So when I uh, want to open the window, um, here I can also lower the shade manually. But then when I want to um, put up again, it's not working here. It's, it would be a, like a logic solution. I just pull this lever and then the shade comes. You know, first the window and then the shade. That would make sense. It's not possible when lowering it, it goes down, but I can't put it up again that way. Then I have to go here deep in the menu. Yes, I'm continuing with that today, deep in the menu. So, um, and then I have to switch it here on the screen that this shade comes up. And I wonder, I mean, if you're driving 10 hours all day and maybe this is kind of like a hobby, it takes more time to use car functions. And I'm, you know, I'm keeping myself busy uh, while being chauffeured. That's maybe a thing, you know, but I tend to say, I want to have things straightforward and just technology improvement when it makes my life easier and not more complicated. Also, you know, where are the seat controls here that I can like put the seat forward or backward again, just like in one second. It's not there. It's again in the screen that they don't need so much, so many buttons. So, and then I have to go to the home menu again, switch to seats and then control the driving position here. What I want to have. It works, yes, and they've done a great job and everything looks great and so on, but it just takes more time. You will get faster over time, but when we directly compare the old school solution and the new school solution, the user interface is just taking more time now. And this is the thing I meant. So, I mean, considering it is an early, ah, there we go, it's an early production model. Uh, so things will still improve also software wise definitely but uh, i just had a screen crash now i had to wait until the screen reloads itself so um but w when i would have separate seat control here i could still do that and don't care about the crashing screen but here then you have to wait for the screen to re restart and it took like two minutes now or something and by the way at least what is redundant is a door control you have three way Yes, three-way, I got it, I got that, thank you. <laughs> and then you have three ways to adjust, uh, to open the door here. When you press this button, it just opens slightly and then you can press it further. Second way is this button up here. This is then the automatic door opener and it really opens all the way. Oh, sorry, that gets really bright now, you know. And then we can close it all again. And then the manual way, because this is of course, uh, you know, important emergency phase if this is the manual door opener um, when all electronics fail it you can still manually open that door oh my god this is not spacious enough yeah of course now we can use the executive being chauffeured position and i activate it here on the screen set lounge position it is called and there we can see magic the front seat is moving forward see of course it takes a while while well, that is going forward i can also show you this one here the armrest again inductive charging pad air is being sucked away and then here is some storage with two more usb c chargers and the quality of the materials how everything is processed in the interior is really outstanding and now there we go yeah i think i'm gonna take my shoes off now and because you can see here the seat it's going up. Oh, this is awesome, right? This is awesome. Look at that. Wow. This is really amazing. Super comfortable. And then you can also rest your feet here on this you know, special footrest that is being going up. Oh, 
this is really amazing now the seat is going a little bit more backward and once again you know me with 189 with and six foot two this is sufficient for my size actually it's still going now position is reached oh hmm maybe i should switch and start traveling just here in this position and get a driver you want to be my driver applications in the comments <laughs> that would be awesome right and we also can get to know each other right so yeah wow well, this is extremely comfortable it works size-wise what a great idea here so this is really some amazing equipment here and also the head restraint is super comfortable so is it king of luxury now from what we've seen here so far maybe not king of user interface but which car is that nowadays but from the comfort perspective wow this is outstanding indeed and i really don't need a rolls or bentley now indeed and now it's time for the theater mode let's try it with the voice input hey bmw activate theater mode <laughs> yeah that's a cool effect with the sound and so on right so it goes down like this you always have to ensure that the front seats are also uh, you know far away down yes keep using and then uh, this is here with Amazon Fire TV and you can have for example Prime Video but you can also watch YouTube so that would be possible depending of course on the online connection so here, for example, you can watch pre-downloaded content then, um, if you have done it before and don't have a Wi-Fi connection, that is one possibility. Thomas? Hey. What are you doing there? <laughs> I'm only taking a look at our footage because that's the thing, what you can also do here. So we connected now this MacBook here with an HDMI cable to the screen and then we can take a look at our footage here, which we have just been shooting. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very crisp, this image quality. Really cool, of course, here in full 4K now, here in Auto Groove for you. Well, to work really with it, that is creating too much delay. That doesn't really make sense. But, for example, if you have something, you know, like movies maybe on your laptop and want to have the HDMI connection, that would be possible. Um, you can then select the source, either the Fire TV or then here the HDMI. It is also USB-C connection on the back part, but that is not for using as input. That would have been cool as well, maybe like with a USB-C stick or something, but that's not possible. But yeah, it does deliver you some possibilities. And the, let's say, more straightforward use would be, I mean, here at the back part of the seats, there's USB-C charging, also some mounts for uh, iPad holders. So yeah, at the end of the day, is it really useful, this theater screen? It's great for the show effect. But will people rather use their own devices and watch the thing on their smartphone or on the tablet? Probably yes. Or what's your take on that? And the shade of the panoramic roof, by the way, is going forward. So it starts at the rear here and then it's being rolled in in the front. And the reason for that is by that they can also ensure more rear headroom because they are storing it here in the front. That's a very clever idea indeed. You cannot open the sunroof, it's just that blind you can close or open. And the secondary interior here with bright styling, the same style, same color you can also get with the leatherette veganza material, so that would look and feel the same. And this one here is also an i7, but that's once again from the interior, how can I see that? It's actually just the one thing that is here, the B and the D, so we have the, the like the, the full recuperation mode we can pick here um, instead of the S mode for the combustion engines. But that's basically about it. Everything else is the same. There's also no compromise as for headroom or something. So it is really, they went for, hey, we built one vehicle and then you pick the different powertrains. But in driving, they will differ or will they? Well, we're going to find out. Oh, and the blue ring around the steering wheel. That's, of course, the other thing you can see that it's an electric vehicle here or the EV version on the interior. And now to the trunk. Let's take a look. 540 liters here for the petrol version. We'll soon also compare the EV. 
See here, the cabin trolley also easily fits in in a vertical way, so good measurement, of course. Then here, I installed a light right there that you can also see the back of the vehicle. And this is the length of, let's say, like 115 in meters or 45 inches. And the crucial width here on the inside is a little bit less than 80 centimeters or 31 inches. It's just way wider here on the very front part. Interesting also the height, of course, and this is at 57 centimeters or 22 inches. And this is the trunk of the EV of the i7. You see here in the petrol version, like this step was a little bit lower. So this whole floor is a little higher. However, in the front, you still have space for the charging cable. It's just that this then here is covered. And the height difference then is that here we are at 50 centimeters or 20 inches, whereas we were at 22 inches or 57 centimeters with the petrol version. So this is the gap then you lose in height with the EV version. I think you can live with that. Welcome to Thomas's luxury driving lounge. And I really wanted to start with dynamic driving. It's soon to come. But then I was driving straight and I thought like, I have to begin with driving straight because this vehicle here, the all-new BMW 7 Series, is already a star when just driving straight. I mean, I'm just driving this pure straight road and then like, I'm flying, you know? You can also have the assistance systems here. They're keeping you in the lane, active lane keeping assist, very smooth as for the transitions and so on. And you hear almost nothing from the outside you are totally decoupled from everything. So the stress level is immediately lower. It's great comfort in the seats and so on. Wow, just wow. The, the luxury comfort we have here is outstanding. And yeah, once again, I have to say to one of the first questions, are they closing the gap here to Bentley and Rolls-Royce? Definitely. I mean, they're almost making Rolls-Royce obsolete it's about more like the individual choices, of course. That's the thing then, you know, and, but it's really more about you pay more because you want to pay more, but you don't have to, although this is not cheap at all, you know, but yeah, this is easily driving wise also king of luxury. Wow. But then we're also, it's still a BMW. That's why I initially also wanted to begin with that. What's to come here. You could maybe also already see it right here winding corners here outside of palm springs california really testing the vehicle how agile is it although it is that large it has that long wheelbase short um, remark to the fuel economy here of the eight cylinder 4.4 4.4 liter eight cylinder you can in a calm driving you know motorway 100 kilometers 60 miles an hour cruise control do some nine to ten liters on the one kilometers and some 25 mpg us or even in the 30s of the mpg uk that is possible if you use that power a little bit it can also easily up jump up to about 30 meters or more kilometers and then more go down below 20 mpg both us and uk so that's like the the spectrum and we will test first here the petrol engine the v8 and then we will get to the i7 to the all electric version and compare also what is actually better petrol or electric. I know this area here a little bit. That's why I know we can, you know, just hold here on the right side and then do an acceleration onto the road again without, um, you know, having any, any kind of risk or something. So here we go. And I'll put it to the my modes. It's a little bit tough to select that here and then I put to sports mode and there's no one there's one car coming and then we can hit the accelerator pedal and let's see it's a little slightly uphill let's see let's go <laughs> Blop, that's 55 miles an hour wow so that was almost zero to 60 miles an hour Woo! wow so that was something. You good, Michelle? He's like, I mean, it did like the super quick acceleration, that V8 sound hammered in. 
and he's like, oh, I'm flying still. This is so relaxing. So, yeah, let's see if I can get him out of his relaxing mode here, Michelle. So, we are hunting up these corners and see how agile is it. This vehicle has everything in it. Adaptive air suspension goes a little bit stiffer than here in these corners and also the integral active steering so that's a rear axle steering and together also with the anti-roll stabilization and this car is not leaning into the corners at all wow um the weight distribution here is a little bit worse with the petrol engine than with the ev so the goal is always 50 50 at bmw and the ev has perfect 50 50. this one here the petrol has like just slight percentage um, more to the front exit because of the uh, of the petrol engine but it's just just a little difference so this was I talked to the chief engineer and he said actually one of his biggest task with this um, one platform solution was to exactly achieve that that both drive quite equal is that true we'll find out very soon I can already tell you here so far with the petrol engine it drives phenomenal and you know I'm testing a lot of different vehicles and in the last 10 years I've been driving I don't know 1,500 different cars this one is no doubt one of the most exceptional ones rarely do we find that a vehicle especially of that size has this kind of agile driving feeling I mean and it's really it's really super unique on the one hand it feels extremely smooth and comfortable. On the other hand, you feel like, wow, I mean, this is actually quite light and and very sporty indeed. So uh, we can also do that with it, like what the truck does, with the local. Yeah, just always try to obey the speed limit. I still need my driver's license. Wow, and then, I mean, this V8 has a nice sound. It gets you a little bit more emotions. Let's see if that EV later on can keep up to that. But it's also battery smooth when you hit the accelerator pedal. There's no delay whatsoever from that V8. And this slightly growling sound, not accelerated at all. Steering gives me a very good feeling. Wow, what a view down to Palm Springs. So steering gives me a great possibility to control the vehicle. I can't believe I'm driving such a huge and long vehicle. It doesn't feel like that at all. Michelle? He's it's flabbergasted. Super, super relaxing, kind of. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm really not driving slowly here, you know? So, uh, and they're like, also like the G-force that I applied on the body. Sometimes when you hitting these serpentine roads, especially like the co-driver saying like, no, no. <laughs> no, but he's like, I'm really driving quite quickly here. I mean, yeah, this uh, truck driver here in front of me, that, he is really onto this now here too. He must be feeling way different than we uh, in this in this 7 Series here. But wow, driving dynamics wise, this is on another level. And not only in comparison to the, the previous, which was already good, definitely. But yeah, I mean, also the competition. They are building very, very nice cars as well. No doubt about that. But this is also driving wise, both in the comfort and in the uh, agility direction. Really, this owns the competition. And I, I rarely say that, you know. So, and you know, when you're, you're a long term subscriber here, that, you know, that I'm for Germany doesn't have anything to do in how I rate cars from which countries and most cars are international built anyway BMW also builds a lot of their cars in the US primarily especially the SUVs so and I'm also not brand focused or something so they say oh like this is my favorite brand therefore I rate it in a, in a better way or something like that a lot of you guys already know that uh, I used to own a lot of Jaguars and so on huge fan of all the British vehicles and so on so I can really just say that without any bias this is one of the most superb cars in you know in, in in the driving definitely like ever wow I'm, I'm really just literally blown away how good that is so um yeah and i mean when i just think about hey picking in a nice color getting the uh, new veganza uh 
evolved center tech seats here for animal free seating maybe in a bright color or something that would have been a kick-ass combination right so um yeah just have to recheck then again if i can really afford that <laughs> so yeah that, that's of course always uh something else with the bmw 7 series uh you, oh, you could also wait 10 years and then buy a used one <laughs> so um yeah i mean usually after three years they lose half of the um of the price these very expensive vehicles so you might wait in at least three years or something wow this is i mean it's it's strange i mean quite often you have cars that are really comfortable and relaxing and you have cars that are really sporty and then the variables sway, change a little bit and rarely had i had a, an experience where i have so much sporty driving power fun but so much relaxed comfort at the same time it seems like a complete contradiction you know so it seems like a uh, like a goal conflict but it's actually true wow that is really cool driving modes it was a sport mode here and we can also go to the um say like the relax mode in the relax mode well, in the relax mode the, that was a nice test as well so the sunshade goes da uh, goes to close in the relax mode we have our camera mounted up there and that was thank you good boy so that was well done by the sunshade it did hit the camera mount but it did them immediately stop and not destroy it. And we, believe me, we had other sunshades there before. So, well done, sunshade. That's live here in Auto Fuel, the most authentic experience in reviewing you can get. In relaxing mode, not sure if you feel it, uh, Michelle. Um, there is, yeah, that's the stuff. <laughs> there is the seat massage. I also feel it. That's very well done, that seat, seat massage, right? Will you also be happy with the six cylinder engine? Definitely, it will deliver more than enough power it will have a better fuel economy they are electrifying their whole portfolio even though when you don't have an all electric version you have always like a mild hybrid in build then or then the plug-in hybrid will also be available of course together with the six cylinder petrol engine so my tip rather would be then to stick with the smallest petrol engine if you don't go ev yet because this will be totally sufficient and will already deliver you the same kind of fun and yes the v8 always has some kind of better sound however this car is so well insulated that you heard it maybe earlier but you don't hear the engine that much because the cabin is so well insulated i mean there's no wind noise whatsoever from the exterior um yeah that's really I'm also like 21 inch wheels on this vehicle and still such a great comfort from suspension if you want an even softer ride you would stick with smaller wheels so no matter which car you have you can always vary comfort and sportiness with the wheels the bigger wheels you you get the sportier the car will feel the more direct it will feel when you get smaller wheels it will have more dampening from the tire and you will have more comfort so you can just choose that yourself And here we go. This is the i7, the all-electric version of the all-new BMW 7 Series. And, well, the first surprising thing is you hardly feel a difference, at least when driving straight here now. Have this great floating ride from the air suspension. And since you, you feel the shifting, of course, in the combustion engine, but since it's done in a very smooth way, it's not a huge difference. So from the get-go here, there has hardly ever been a vehicle where there are different powertrain versions of it, where the difference between the EV and the non-EV version is so little in the first feeling. So that's, that's really, really interesting. Um, of course, you have the throttle input is a like little bit more directly, but they also both tuned these vehicles in a way that there also is not the biggest difference between that. So, wow, super interesting. And when there would be like the V8 sound, it would be almost the same. There is also the sound here, these iconic sounds, as I call it. We will soon hop to the sports mode, do the same acceleration as we did yesterday. This one here on paper, a little bit less quick in this version, 
later, as I said, there will be electric version, all electric version, which will be even quicker than everyone. And in a sport mode, the sound will be even more enhanced. So we will experience that. But when you're driving straight here now, you basically get almost the same experience both with the petrol and the EV. This um, sonorous low frequency growling from a six or eight cylinder is of course always something that just, you know, appears to your body somehow, you know? That's um, not necessarily a thing like, oh, we're petrol heads or something. That's, it's for real, you know? Also with vibrations and something. So that is kind of cool. Um, but it, you don't feel it here, but since this vehicle has such a great insulation, the difference again is not that large. So now sports mode and we'll hear more of these iconic sounds. Let's accelerate it out. Let's go. Launch control. Plop, that's 55 miles an hour. Wow. Whew. And you also heard that sound building up. That was pretty amazing. You liked it, Michelle? He's a fan of iconic sound stuff. Um, you know, you can always deactivate it. So everything you hear now from this, you can completely deactivate it. It's just a thing like if you want that. Um, it is not very extreme. So there are electric vehicles where you have more sound feedback. So here they thought with a 7 Series, we don't exaggerate it. You know, in the sports mode here, you hear, of course, more of that. I think it's still subtle enough. Here now in these corners, once again, they feel pretty similar. So the EV has a little bit better weight distribution. And also the center of gravity is lower because the batteries are put in the floor. We've seen the cutaway model. Then again, the overall weight, of course, the battery is quite heavy. So, yeah, but you know, the, the question is really, what's the result then for the customer? And I have to say, once again, it feels pretty similar. So uh, I can just stress how it was with the slower driving. Also here, it is actually less than expected. There is also this instant acceleration. It's so super smooth. The feeling from the throttle pedal is a little bit more linear and artificial, of course. With a ICE, internal combustion engine, you always have some kind of power curve, which somehow feels more natural because it's not that digital, it's not that linear. And to me, this is something, let's say, a little bit more human, you know what I mean? Um, again, the difference is not that large. And here, wow, it's so well put on the road doesn't shake up at all. It's a lot of fun and at the same time it's super comfortable once again. Yeah, I'm really once again impressed by the driving behavior here. And we don't have it here that we would feel, oh, like because of the weight of the batteries we are getting pushed out of the corners or something. Hmm. The big question is indeed, is any of these vehicles here, or any of these versions, you have to say, more fun? And it's a tough question, you know. Sometimes I'm absolutely certain when I have these ratings or these verdicts and I'm, you know, like, okay, this is more fun or this is more fun. But here, it's both a lot of fun, definitely. Hmm. Maybe I would say that when you have the combustion engine, it feeds a little bit more natural because of that power curve. So it's, to me, it is not that perfect like you know this digitalized linear power curve of the of the EV and because it is less perfect it feels to me more natural and maybe a little bit more likable so when I'm just based it on the pure feeling thing maybe yeah I would say the combustion engine is still a little bit more pleasing I don't need the V8 for that. I would just be fine with the six cylinder. I think the BMW six cylinder is the best engine pick in the whole lineup across all the models. The inline six petrol from BMW is the best, best engine you can pick there. 
but that's you know on the on the pure fun side and also with, with minor difference <clears throat> um, here the crucial thing is really charging infrastructure so if you're willing to go EV yet and you have the charging infrastructure you can as well go for the i7 no problem if you're driving every day long 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 mileage and have no good charging possibility then of course it's still uh, one of the combustion engines and um, so i think it really rather comes down to do we have the charging infrastructure or not that's that's really the, the, the crucial thing as for recuperation so far we're going uphill but we're soon finishing this uphill run here and i'll talk more about the recuperation modes at the moment we're in the adaptive mode and that means that usually when i lift the throttle there is rather rolling only when here now the car is in front of me and I'm too close to it, then recuperation is happening. There's somewhat like of a good compromise. The only thing is that it's not that predictable what the car will do. If you rather want that, you can also pull this shifting lever and then you are in the B mode and then you have more one pedal driving feeling. So here, always, oh, wow, really strong deceleration. That is a true one pedal driving. So if you prefer that, you can have that. Talking about the driving modes, by the way, as for the steering, um, the steering is crisp and direct. Um, the only thing I, I would like to be improved, BMW more moved to the direction of, hey, let's make the car easy and light to steer, and by that convey a feeling of being more agile. Whereas the old school approach, especially in sporty vehicles, is more like, hey, let's apply more feeling to the vehicle by giving it a little bit more resistance. And uh, to me, I feel it's somehow cooler when the steering has some more resistance in it. See here in the sports mode, it's still pretty light. So again, it's crisp and direct. Yeah, in the sport mode, you have a little bit more resistance, but me personally as a driver, I would like to have a little bit more resistance in the steering wheel, but it's still fine. And of course, big advantage for the EV is we went uphill now, and when we go downhill again, we will gain so much energy back. So of course, the EV then, especially when there are topography changes, is so much more efficient. And here we go with our test result for today. So it's three miles per kilowatt hour and that means considering a 102 kilowatt hour battery yeah over 300 miles of electric range it's like 500 kilometers you can see here we've been driving two over 200 miles for you today and this is here by the way we gained over 22 kilowatt hours back to the battery by recuperation overall that's a comparable result and a good result also, if you compare it to the competition, like the Mercedes EQS, the Mercedes EQS has better wind efficiency on the motorway, yes. But it does not feature a heat pump yet. Probably receive it later. Here, the BMW i7 already gets a heat pump from standard equipment. So you're also safe then in winter times. So I did adapt to the temperature outside now a little bit. And yeah, I think that's also fitting to the vehicle, isn't it? <laughs> So the question is, we had a lot of questions initially, does it own even Bentley and Rolls-Royce? Yeah, kinda. I don't need a Bentley or Rolls-Royce when I can have that. You just pay extra in price without getting any more benefit, actually. You can have everything with that. Plus, they now also have the new animal-free interior. We haven't had it today. We've already seen it in the X7, and that's absolutely perfect. And that's why they have a more sustainable setup and they really can combine the luxury and sustainability aspect, of course, as far as possible. Question also, petrol versus the EV here. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's really a question of infrastructure. You have to have that. Otherwise, um, you know, it's definitely more complicated. Here with a range of about 500 kilometers or 300 miles, the EV is slightly catching up at least to the V8. Especially if you have the six-cylinder, you will have even more range. Of course, the six-cylinder will be king of range. So yes, the combustion engines will still give you a higher range. That's for certain. The question is your driving profile and is your charging infrastructure ready yet? 
From a driving experience, both come so close indeed, you can't really say the other one is way more fun than the other one or something. I felt like this low sonorous frequency sound of the H-Cylinder does deliver some more natural fun driving feeling, a little bit just, than the i7. But again, it's not a huge difference. That shouldn't be the crucial point if you go EV or not, actually. And what about the direct competition from the premium manufacturers like Mercedes, for example? Well, especially with the rear comfort, it's easily or way better than the Mercedes EQS and also everything else. The only thing with these new vehicles here, also in this new generation, the user interface has become more complicated. That's also the thing here. You can use, get used to it a little bit, but still, I think at some points they were going in a too complicated direction. Other than that, what an impressive vehicle. This is my in-depth review of the all-new Mercedes S-Class, including autobahn driving and a nighttime driving feature. Let's go. You're watching Auto Gefühl with Thomas and the all-new Mercedes S-Class V223, so the standard US version or the one with long wheelbase in Europe. Here in the AMG line, that means a sportier styling here in the front, but it's not as sporty as, for example, when you compare E63 versus normal E-Class. Here, the AMG styling is the most prominent thing is actually here in this part, this air intake. The grille doesn't look too different and also in the S-Class, the AMG still gets the standing star in the front, which is, you know, it just fits to the S-Class and I think it's good that they kept it here with this model. Then the lamps come standard with multi-beam LED function and optional the so-called digital light with micro mirrors, which can also project things on the road, actually. And here, just only one daytime running light stripe. I think that's not a good decision. They now differentiate it with dots. So the S-Class gets three dots, the E-Class two dots inside, and the C-Class one. Hmm. Okay, can we just repeat this shot and show it once more? Look how the stars mirroring in the front hood and the light reflects. Ooh. And you have this huge sensor area. They are hidden behind this one. It looks fancy, but what I found out by mistake is like when you squeeze it, you hear that? Uh -uh, uh -uh. That doesn't sound too good, right? Oh, and what I always love, you even have dark exterior color and then the bright interior color. It mixes so well this contrast, right? The length is at 5 meters 29 or 208 inches. Has grown a little bit in length if you compare it to the predecessor. And wheels come actually from 18 to 21 inch. These here are the 20 inch wheels and I think they have a very interesting styling. Would you notice what the color is? Oh, the yeah, no handles go in. I just touched them here, yeah, barely. So they fold in and out. Zoom more deals to that. So the color here, it looks black, right? But if you look closely, it has some brown shade. So it's actually a very, very dark brown. Or black with brown accentuations. I don't know. Classic for an S-Class is here. This bow right there from the you know, from a C pillar here, this is how you actually realize it's an S class, and the end of the bow is almost here at the center of the back wheel in the middle part, like this. This is the typical S class design element and the typical sedan shape. Rear axle steering is a big highlight here in the rear axle. You can see it also from these shots, and it's the most important technology feature, I think, because the rear wheels can go up to 10 degrees in the opposite direction, and that actually reduces the turning circle by two meters. That's enormous. And air suspension is standard. Optional, you can get the e-active body control, that the car can also a little bit lean into the corner. The rear looks sleeker than before, and here these tail lamps make it at the same time wider, so a more fluent design here. This is general at the moment theme with the Mercedes design language, but it also looks, you know, less differentiating if you compare the smaller Mercedes sedans. S500 is our version for today. Always comes with all-wheel drive, says 4MATIC right here, has a rear-wheel bias. Then, out of the fake exhaust police because the real exhaust on the inside. Yeah, but then this hmm, extended tip. I don't know. What do you think? I think not. <laughs> so far, only with BMW. Here now at Mercedes, when you open the hood, pull it twice and then it's actually opened. That's really the cool thing. Yes, I'm showing the standing 
star once again. <laughs> That's the cool thing here. Then you can just lift it up and there it is. And you have three liter six cylinders and also four liter V8. And then the 12 cylinder for the Maybach version. You can also find the review here on our channel. And then there are the diesels, three liter diesels for Europe. And this one here, the S500, 430 horsepower, 4.9 seconds in the acceleration. And there will also be plug-in hybrids. Door closing sound. Yeah, really cool. It has some kind of vintage closing sound as well, so that's interesting. And there's also soft close here. When you approach the vehicle or you open it with the key fob, then the door handles fold out. And yeah, I'm not too convinced of that. You can press it here then again to close it. And then also, you know, when you approach it again, it should also open, yeah, like this. But I think it's making things just complicated, actually. Then inside of the door, beautiful job here with the mad wood interior, actually. And there's the light switch that also works pretty, you know, pretty well, easy. But then here, there's one button philosophy. So this is like one button field for the seat cooling, seat heating, also the memory function. And it just appears cheap when it's like just one button with this capacitive function. These are better, the window levers, definitely. Then this is the AMG line also in the interior. So we have AMG floor mats and also these aluminum pedals and the AMG steering wheel, which has a good handle. It's really nice while driving. It has these two horizontal spokes right there. This is really interesting. It looks cool and also the size is great. But then once again, the capacitive buttons where you have to slide and that's especially while driving again not a step forward but rather backward the seats here in a very luxurious design these cushions here are amazing they are just so soft and covered with microfiber for the main seats only animal skin available from stock you can also request an all fabric interior and i all think this should be in the configurator and also a full leatherette option like tesla is offering should also be in the configurator like a high grade one so they need to step things forward right there. As for the seating position, super, super comfortable. I just love it. It's very soft, very plush, and especially long-term. I've also driven this car now, you know, almost 800 kilometers in our test here, and this was no problem at all. And for me, it's 86 or 6 with one, still leaves some headroom. This is the one then here with a panoramic roof, which has these rather complicated sliders. Meanwhile, I have a little bit of practice, but again, real buttons would be better there. And another major fail is here. This unit for the seat, it's look, looking still cool, but you cannot move this thing. So back in the past, for the previous generation, you could move these elements and then they were doing something. Now you kind of touch them and then the seat moves, but it doesn't give you feedback. Interior overview, 12.3 inch digital instruments, 12.8 inch central screen. And this is here all piano lacquer, so this collects so much scratches and fingerprints and so on. But here, this area with the wooden atmosphere, mad wood, just listen to that. This is so beautiful, awesome. And everyone who's looking at that vehicle said, oh my God, this looks amazing from the inside. The looks. What about the user interface? Going to take a look at that. But first of all, finish the looks here, the air mats on the top part. They also belong to the, you know, screaming out features. And of course, the ambient lighting, which is, for example, also changing if you control temperature, like here, warmer, then you have these red stripes and colder, you have these blue ones. That looks amazing. And steering wheel, once again, great form. It feels so much sportier in the AMG line with the AMG line steering wheel. But I'm not happy with the capacitive buttons here, also, for example, for the volume control and so on. The head display is always hard to see, but it offers a lot of information, even some augmented reality function. Hey, and seen that? Yes. Mercedes star. You can also watch it here from inside the cockpit. That's of course a main thing always. Instruments, you can see here the blinking IR, so infrared sensors, and they are only visible here on camera. You do not see them with your own eyes. And they are watching you, they are controlling you. Ooh. <laughs> then here, the fuel economy. This is excellent, actually. This was not predominantly motorway driving with cruise control. And that would mean nine liters per kilometer is 26 mpg US, 31 mpg UK. However, when you, you know, think more in realistic terms and so on, this can also be higher, of course, than something 10, 11 liters or some 
20 mbg us some 25 mbg uk when you drive more city or when you drive a little bit faster and so on this was here the ideal consumption this is not flickering in real life by the way only again just on camera yeah i can make it a little bit less yeah like this so it really depends on the camera setting and then you can see it also here live um, this then the map all over the screen but you also have different views like for example this here assistance systems view um, or this view is different and then also the the whole styling in the central infotainment change hey mercedes how can i help what's the difference between mercedes and bmw super business is all about competition <laughs> hey mercedes how may i help you set temperature to 22 degrees Temperature is 20 degrees. Not 22, but at least 20. <laughs> Details to the screens. Here, the temperature control always stays in the same place. That's good. However, it's just more effort to do it like this than with physical buttons. And here in the lower part, this one button, this is like one, this whole thing is one button. That's so weird. And here also a slider for the volume, for example. I think that really downgrades the otherwise fantastic interior indeed. Here, the software you can see here the Apple CarPlay integration and the sound system here Burmester sound system is really amazing when you pump it up really loud y'all <laughs> and then also have good bass and so on you really feel it in you know in your feet actually down there this is so amazing so a great sound system really a big fan of it then you can go back to the Mercedes menu with the home screen it looks like this and the GPS is right here and it's also let's say somewhat responsive enough and also has good route guidance I tested that yesterday on the motorway so I'm um, also you know had a good rerouting and so on so I'm actually then happy with that so most of the time I probably use the car internal GPS and then the Apple CarPlay system other interesting features are for sure here comfort because there you can pick different massage and the wave massage is my very favorite one also put it to intensive and then it really goes like in these dots here from the top part not sure if you can hear that on the microphone to the lower part and also really on the seating area this is really amazing and the ambient lighting another favorite feature of course where you can really set the different colors and so on you can also see then here on the top right there red maybe yes it's oh there it is um, pink style yeah it's more red here because of the AMG maybe you can also pick multi-color then um, it has kind of coming out kind of dissolving into the right doors and so on and so on and brightness of course always all the way up oh and that's nice here look at that the visor sun visor is kind of double you can fold down this and then you have here and here actually yeah including this annoying warning sign but it's mandatory in the lower area you can slide this one open adaptive cup holders but they work for very big bottles for you know taller bottles they wobble and around these bottles so not ideal and two usb-c chargers smartphone inductive charger but it's like way deep in there so not the most like uh, practical solution so um you know in this case then schmooze is hidden there <laughs> and uh, here's another area to put things actually like a microfiber towel and then you can have this split opening here to more USB-C charging and also another inductive charging mat. Rear seating area also looks amazing. Same seat structure with the quilting. And then we also have the rear seat entertainment, but mm, I'm not so sure about crash safety for these. Definitely better without them. And then there's also another tablet here in the middle part. However, you can get a four-seater with a fixed middle console or this one here. This is the five-seater version, which has the possibility to make it five seats or then fold down this console at the inside of the rear passenger door you can press this button and then that front seat moves like this forward it takes a while it goes also a little bit more upward for the driver then it does block the view to the right front so that is a safety issue indeed for the chauffeur but well here that's then all about the comfort right here look at that leg room that is building up there and also then here the footrest is right here for most comfort and then it looks like this so super relaxing however with one with a6 or 6 of one you could not fully stretch your legs you need to be like 180 or five foot nine 
then you can also really fully stretch your legs or another trick is to be like little bit sideways then it's also better but I mean nevertheless it's very nice to relax right here and do something else just have that enormous space and then again you can make it five to four seater and have another cubby hole right here with USB-C charging and also in the lower part you have more USB-C and H also HDMI control so you can have um, you know some interface for the screens and so on so this is a very cool atmosphere and the rear cushions here just again are amazing, super comfortable, my favorite feature of this vehicle actually. And now the rear ones here can also be heated. And as you can see here, there's ventilation for the rear seats and heating and also at the same time, for what is that? Well, for example, it's winter time and you got wet in rain or something, then you can dry and be warm at the same time. And from here you can also control that rear shade. Well, on this tablet here in the rear, you can pick the massage functions for the rear seats. However, the wave massage for the front seats is not available here in the rear, but yeah, at least we have some other possibilities and you can control right and left. And this is also really sophisticated. And you can also control it here right there on the screen is also touch. And now welcome to Thomas's passive driving lounge being chauffeured. Cornelius was so nice to do it here today because we always take your feedback seriously you want to see when we review a luxury sedan class you always show me being driven and of course the first thing i would do right here is activate this lying position and just one press of a button right here and i mean but already the normal position is super comfortable here in that seat it's of course always spectacular to see how it moves forward and upward and so on it does block the view for Cornelius then a little bit to the right front but yeah here then it's about the VIP being chauffeured right here and I was just driving in the Audi A8 in the rear and I really have to say the seat here is way more plush so even without this function here of course in the A8L you also have this kind of chauffeur function but the seating itself I feel is more comfortable here with the S-Class and my shoes are gladly um, clean, so I can also put them on here. But um, yeah, even in the Maybach, I cannot stretch my legs completely. So, um, but still, I mean, it's a very comfortable position here, really relaxing. And now being on the motorway zone, um, I could take out my, you know, take out my smartphone and um, check some emails, also, or for example, uh, or just relax a little bit. It's a little bit hot today. I can um, activate the seat cooling here. Ambient lighting is also for right here. And I also have the shade right here. So, oh, oh, that's the shade. It's the upper shade here. And then here I have the control for the rear shade behind me, that one, Let's see here. Yeah, here we go. And I can also lower these shades here in the side windows. But yeah, actually to have some more privacy and a um, little bit less um, impact from the sun, that's of course a good idea. Middle console. I can fold down here for that screen because when it's like this, I cannot reach the screen right there, um, you know, without leaning uh, forward all the way. So that's actually then a practical thing to have. So now I got the tablet running. I have uh, basically all the functions mirrored. I have there also in the front. Then I can also activate the different massage forms. Um, for example, here on the activating massage, and wow, that's really so relaxing. It's a very very sophisticated massage. That's what I really fancy. So, yeah, massage function is probably the thing that I would um, do most of the time in here with this tablet in, in my hand. Um, or maybe also change a little bit of the um, ambient lighting or so on from here. So at least from here, when you play around with the ambient lighting right here, then you're not distracted as a driver is, and then you can just enjoy the different colors here. I mean, these cushions, these cushions here are so comfortable and they can also be heated in the rear. That's of course another great comfortable feature. Suspension-wise also the S-Class has the most plush air suspension, I would, I would say. If you also compare Audi A8 and BMW 7 Series. So yeah, I think for the rear passenger, the S-Class really leads it because the other ones, BMW 7 Series and Audi A8, are more fun to drive yourself. But the S-Class is better when being driven. Trunk space is 550 liters or 12 cubic feet and the length here is yeah almost 120 in meters or 47 inches and you see here 
vertical way for the cabin trolley is actually no problem. And loading things through actually just works via this middle C hatch. You have to open it from the rear and like twice and here like, hello. Oh, and then it stays open. That's a cool feature. Oh, and then through the ski hatch, you directly look through the infotainment system. Wow, that's an amazing perspective, isn't it? Just found out about that. Super interesting. Hey, welcome at night. I mean, what a great song. What a great song. Gotta check this out here. Maybe watch a YouTube review. <laughs> review? Just Google it. Google it? YouTube search on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> so, but we want to experience the car and of course don't want to get any copyright issues with the automatic you know, recognition of songs and so on. This is original Thomas Driving Lounge here at night with the Mercedes S-Class S500 on 430 horsepower from this 3-liter inline six-cylinder and this also has mild hybrid technology here now. So when I'm on the brakes, this EQ charge meter goes up and so I can regenerate some of the power back again. This helps the fuel economy and you can drive this car actually, you know, very efficient. So my best result for long-term motorway driving is indeed some nine liters and more kilometers which is then some 30 mpg. That's excellent for this kind of engine, for this kind of size. Of course, if you have more city traffic, then it's more going, oh, look at that, the adaptive light, the digital light is already active. Oh, it's also illuminating the speed camera. Very dangerous at night, you cannot see it before. Wow, it begins here directly with spectacular action. You can see here how the, you know, how the left and right is illuminated and then cars in front of me are being spared out that they are actually not being blinded by the light. So that's a great feature indeed and it's just done automatically and we will more and more experience we're going way through the dark into the countryside that we can see more of that light and I mean from both cameras. I mounted this camera here today a little bit more behind that you can also see this area here to the right Oh, it looks so cool when it's illuminated at night and even continue further onto the rear seating. This is actually one of my favorite features both in the new S-Class and also in the Mercedes EQS that they look so extremely stunning at night. This brings so much more emotion to it, you know, and I just love driving this car at night. The standard air suspension is set on such a soft tone that you really still feel that's an air suspension. And then you put on your favorite songs, put on your favorite ambient lighting, and you can just really like flow through the night, I would call it that way. It's really excellent. Steering input is also very natural, I like that. So you don't have to steer too much. It's not super progressive though, but it feels very natural. And here with the AMG line steering wheel, the car is indeed better to control and feels sportier just by this smaller size steering wheel. I really do prefer that. So that would be my number one reason to go for the AMG line, that you get this steering wheel. Both have the BS capacitive buttons on the steering wheel anyway. So then at least you can pick the sportier one. <laughs> I'm not the one with the, I always call it with the famous slot. You heard me, slot design. In the, it also has a slot design here, this one, but the other one has a, Slottier design? <laughs> Can you call it that way? Wow, that looks amazing now on this camera, right? Wow. I mean, I, I see the picture myself. Wow, this is slow. Then here, the traffic light view, red traffic light. There is, you can see, you see here the red traffic light. Uh, because sometimes it can happen when you're like standing, you know, in a critical situation towards the traffic light, you cannot see it. Then you see it here on the screen. At first, I, I was thinking like, this is a really lazy feature, but, um, there are some situations where it is indeed really useful. When we're driving up here here now, I can put it to the sport mode and we can also hear something more from the engine, but it's really, you know, the dampening is really subtle and such a good insulation from the vehicle. You, I mean, you probably hear it. You almost hear nothing from the outside. That's just fantastic with this vehicle. And there are a lot of things we can play around with, especially at night here. 
in the infotainment system. This always has to be said, you know, there comes now a big disclaimer. Do not do it while driving. I'm not a good example what I'm doing right now. I have some practice doing it. <laughs> and I really try to focus still on the road. I mean, yeah, but it's always somewhat dangerous to play around with that screen. That's always the thing why I also prefer manual climate knobs. At least they stay in the same place here all the time. And I can show you when I'm changing the temperature. You know, it's you know, getting a little colder outside now, though it has been a warm and nice day. Here, when I put it warmer now, we have this. Wow, I mean, it goes all the way into the doors. It looks so amazing. When I want it colder again, the same thing happens then with the blue light, no matter which light I have initially set it to. And this is still also one of my favorite emotional features. And it's not such a complicated move to program that, but it's such a great idea. So whoever had that idea, I mean, I know a lot of Mercedes engineers are always watching, so greetings to you also as well. Um, yeah, and then they ask me about certain things I did in the review. I asked them actually about certain things they built. And so there's also a very good and interesting exchange and also a way that when you write comments about this vehicle here, I can transport these comments through to the engineers and they also read it in the comments themselves. And so indeed it has, when you comment on this video, then it can really have an effect, for example, on the face of, of this vehicle, what can be made better and what needs to be corrected or something or improved and so on. And this is, this is just fantastic that it works this way, you know, nowadays. And of course, everything also thanks to our great community we have here on Autogefühl. Such, you know, positive and constructive feedback discussion here always. People who are really car enthusiasts enjoy the stuff we're doing here at this moment the same way as I do. That's why we are all here, because we share this common passion. That's what I also love about, you know, my job here and especially with you guys in the community. Well, now we're all dark here. With it looks so amazing, you know, this shot and of course this as well. And here, now you can see once again the digital light. Now we have like full power, full throttle in the front, full light throttle. Wow. This look goes so far and I mean, you know, this reflective, reflective um, layers here on the, on the signs. <laughs> it reflects so much and I almost say like it reflects too much actually. Now this uh, hairpin corner is coming ahead. It looks also really very well illuminated. See how there it builds up again. Wow. That actually, you see, you see that? There, it saved some parts out. Me Interesting. Maybe that's because of it's maybe thinking like, oh, there's um, when, when something is reflecting, that might be a car or something. That could be. Wow, have you seen that? There were parked car at the side of the roads and the light spared out the vehicles which were parked at the side of the road. That's super interesting. And you only experience that really when you do such an extensive night drive. And I really this time, you know, like took a lot of time with this vehicle drove it almost like a thousand kilometers now that they could really share, you know, even more experience with you. We have almost full moon, so this is like a really moody night ride we have here. And we have the colors here for the ambient lighting and we have also the brightness effect. And you can not tune it all the way up or I can tune it all the way down. Look at that, how it looks like here. Look at that. I'm disappeared. And now you see like this is the huge difference. This would be the vehicle without any ambient lighting. And we know a lot of vehicles that do not have that. Look at that, how, what a difference it's make. And like half, it's all like, wow, amazing. And let's see the difference, full off. So I'm intentionally driving very slow now, just, you know, for safety precautions. And then all the way up. Oh, no. Yeah, that's what happens. What, what, what happened there, you know? Did I some... I have no idea what it, what the, okay, brightness, here we go, full off, and now let's move it full on, yeah, energize, but oh, we have changed the color, 
So monochrome colors. This is my like, you know, ocean blue. It's really. Oh, there's a multicolor, like this. So you can pick the individual. <laughs> this is like you know, <laughs> like a circus. You know, <laughs> here you could also go, for example, for a green one, like this. Fits in when I'm driving a little bit slowly, more and more efficient. Maybe more on this spectrum here. I mean, it all looks somewhat amazing. Um, or more like pink. This looks. Oh, oh, that's deer. Oh, sweet. Little one, actually. Very slowly now. I've seen the light here building up, so it jumped off off the road. So especially like in that time, of course, we have to be even more precautious here in the countryside routes. Wow, this is really Im there. It, there it is. I hope you can really see that very well on camera. Um, how it sometimes closes and then builds up like a cascade once again to have the full lighting. This is really spectacular. And this looks also amazing. Or oh, what I also really like is here this, you know, some kind of purple color. Mm, I think this, you know, this purple color always looks so like so special. You know, that it would be something unique. That's, I think, um, the thing of that. So, um, or maybe like a little bit more in the bluish too. Like this one, you know, this is more like a purple style. It, I think it also looks really amazing. And let's go to the multicolor mode. There you can see actually that um, you see the area like a like a dissolve from the middle part, then through the outside parts, left and right. This looks also really, really spectacular. Yeah, I mean, you don't even know where to look at, like ambient lighting, infotainment screen, how the light is being built up and back again. You know, when we have um, lanterns on the street, there it is, you know. Then it goes back again, see so like, ah, okay, we're in like the rural side, there's lanterns, and then there are like people, car, other cars around. And when the, there it is, lanterns are gone, full light throttle automatically again, and this is really cool. And because it can really, you know, kind of, kind of, uh, you know, take off some of the individual pixels from that, individual LEDs. This one is even working here with this, you know, with these micro mirrors, which can serve as projectors even. So in future scenarios, something can be projected onto the road for us, for example. You can so individualize the light that you're not blinding others. And I mean, I remember, especially like from the, you know, most recent Land Rovers, like a, or a Range Rover Vela or something, with the automatic head, the headlamps, with high beam, um, the function was working but it was blinding all cars all over the place. And I always got reactions like from people like, what are you doing? It's like, sorry, I'm just, it's a car. It's to be done automatically. So I always had to deactivate that function in the Vela because so many people were like, hey, you, you know, what, what, what the hell are you doing? You're absolutely blinding us. And I was like, well, what, what are these? Ah, okay, they're complaining because of the light. That was very interesting. So here we go now again. There should light should build up there it is and then full light throttle meanwhile we have other whoa that looks fancy like with a contrast to the top and the bottom that looks really fancy this one jungle green venice pink i mean this is also wow and then driving with that one through venice yeah, Malibu Sunset, that is also really amazing, right? Really a way to be back um, in the States as well, as soon as Corona regulations allow it. Wow, and this is also really, I mean, I love this. I mean, I mean when it's more multicolor, it's even more spectacular. And let's just use it now, you know, because we're right here at the motorway, have it on multicolor and to, to sports mode and why not do it sports plus you know for the sake of fun and this multicolor lighting let's go 50 kilometers an hour and accelerate it out let's go
that's 200, 125 miles an hour. Um, and how silent the car is, is just amazing. That is just amazing. And how well the cars are controlled, and look how far we can see ahead with this light. That's really amazing. Sports plus, 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 sports plus mode here. Suspension is also a little bit stiffer. I have more control of the vehicle and it's definitely one of the best silent cars on the road. So well insulated now on the brakes and considering it's such a heavy car, still feels very good and controlled while braking. It is not the sportiest sedan, so BMW 7 Series or an Audi A8 do feel way sportier indeed. Yes, so that's the question what you prefer. Mm, here in the S-Class, the special thing is that you still get this carpet alike driving feeling. That's also, I think, a really cool thing to have. Malibu Sunset another time, like this. <laughs> and then we have these energizing comfort features. This is also interesting. So they combine actually like, um, you know, like the vents, climatization and ambient lighting for driver or why is it separated? This is like refresh now. Then we also have the animation here in the screen. And I also feel like, you know, it's also using this scent machine, perfume machine, which can be quite annoying at times. Oh, it's like a vehicle fail. Now I have also this kind of, you know, perfume scent. And I also have a massage, you now like a vibrating massage in the seat. Very interesting. So this is kind of to, to wake me up a little bit. Oh, and then the, um, the, um, the seat ventilation is also on. That's interesting. Wow. Very cool function. So interesting to have these different schemes. And this is then really to make like, Thomas, don't sleep yet. Let's wake it up. I mean, we have almost midnight, so I really took this night ride as authentic as possible, joining me here midnight in the vehicle. It looks really cool with this animation here. And there, yeah, we're not sure. Can you see it on camera? The almost full moon. There's even sound here coming from that. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, maybe you can't see it, but it's really almost full moon, so this creates also this very special atmosphere here. So we've tested that one. Now we are exit of the motorway and we'll soon get on it again. There's something sound like music happening here as well. Can you hear that? Can you hear that? So and then warmth. Cozy warmth by means of heated seats and surfaces with yellow, whatever. What's it? Ooh. Now we get this one and I get seat heating. And the traffic light view. Thank you. No, that, that's not part of it. So this anim uh, animation now, heated seats, and I haven't seen, have you seen if the temperature changed as well? I didn't pay attention to that, so maybe we can pay attention to that next time. Then we have vitality, provided by stimulating light and stimulating light. What's that supposed to mean? Let's see. Whoa, interesting. Look at that. Oh, the light is changing. Indeed. That's interesting. I also have some sound feeding and also the seat massage is active. Wow, haven't, haven't ever tried all of these features yet. I mean, so um, is that music copyrighted? Hmm. The YouTube algorithm will know afterwards. I'll take the chance. <laughs> That's also very interesting. So then, joy, relaxation, and sunlight lift your mood. Ooh. They have really cool animations here, right? In the screen. That's cool. Still have some seat massage. But it's still so warm. I mean, just the. Short period of seat heating made it really warm. I have to put on the seat cooling now once again. So that was joy. There even more well-being. 
Enhance your feeling of well-being using warmth and soft colors. Let's see. Different color change here. Animation. Ooh. And also this moody music, just like very subtle in, in the background. And people riding this bus there probably look over and think like, what the hell is this guy doing? He's like playing games in his car or, or something. <laughs> Well, we are kind of playing games, right? So, um, in a way. Oh, there's another um, scent, you know, like a... This really smells like a, like a very expensive perfume. It was a nice scent, you know? So I'm not sure if it, like, will, would be annoying over time or something, but... This is really... Wow. Very impressive. So this is kind of, you know, using technology in a nice and surprising way, you know, that they can combine all these features together there. This is really, you know, one of the things where you can say king of luxury here. Very interesting. Well, what about training? Exercise for relaxing muscles and activating or improving activeness. Okay. Muscle simulation. Welcome to 10 minutes of muscle activation. What? 10 minutes? Small, subtle movements. Really? Muscle now? And the help of your back. But current... Unavailable at current speed. Interrupt the exercise as soon as the traffic situation requires. Okay. Carrying out the training exercises lies within your responsibility. Yes, ma'am. Select a straight posture for all exercises that follow. Yeah, probably it's more like you know that we can see the content when the Stand car is staying. Shoulder movements. Move your right shoulder far back in circles. <laughs> Your motion is restricted due to the fact that your hand is on the steering wheel. Yeah, Keep I know. Keep your hand steady on the steering wheel. Yes, ma'am. And Make can I also do acceleration? Goodbye. Okay, I, I rather concentrate now on high-speed motorway driving at night, right? So, um, that's the thing. But, that's now interesting. Your left shoulder far okay. Back in yeah, I know, I know, okay. I said cruise control, but yeah, maybe like the workout is not the best thing to do now. So. Yes, yes, thank you, goodbye. Tips for spontaneous exercise for various reasons. Now, both shoulders together to the back. Your shoulder blades should almost Let's go back to Vitality, that was cool. So, now cruise control here on the motorway while enjoying the Vitality. And the cruise control is holding me speed wise, distance wise, car in front of me, and also. At higher speeds, really controlling if I'm going left or right, holding me very well here in the lane and also with a very smooth process. Now there's a vehicle approaching that's even driving faster than me. Also possible. Blind some auto and oh, this will probably cost you the driver's. Lane. Yeah, realize it now. <laughs> so we had to reduce the speed in now. Wow, that music is now a little bit, maybe a little bit. Whoa. Woo! We're in a music concert. Well, you can, I mean, it's good that you can actually adjust it, you know, and you can also turn it off then here at the steering wheel. And good thing is also, while you, one click on this slider is muting the volume, and that's actually it. Wow, I mean, this has been a nice experience here at night, and I could do this for hours and hours, and just let me know if you really like this special content here at night. Daytime driving with even more car features, normal car features, so to speak, is coming up right now. But tell me in the comments, please, if you like this night drive, dri night time driving special. And if you want to see that with more cars. And if yes, then with what vehicles do you want to see these night rides here? And um, if we should make them separate or if we should include them in the review, let me know what you think. And wow, this, have been, this has been really an immersive experience together with you guys. Now let's switch on the lights. Welcome to the German motorway, now at day. Sports mode, we are at 100 kilometers an hour. And let's see. Plop, that's 160 kilometers an hour. That went quite quick. The engine not that notable actually, so rather subtle. 
the six cylinder we have here in the S500, but still quick acceleration. And in the sports mode, we also have some more feedback from the suspension, so it gets a little bit stiffer. Still, even in the sport mode, the car is set in comfort and, wow, I mean, phew, this is so silent here. 170 kilometers an hour and you hardly hear anything, so the noise insulation is, yeah, probably the best in the industry or among the best in the industry. That is so cool. And I really like this AMG steering wheel. As for, you know, the steering input, the looks and, you know, how you can touch it uh, from the, you know, from the from the form, from the size, and so on. Yeah, I think capacitive buttons they still get on my nerves. Also, when using the cruise control and so on. Here at the moment, road is blocked, so I can just as well use the cruise control, and it immediately also sets in with the lane keeping assist. And you're supposed to keep your hands on the steering wheel here with the level 2 system. Level 3 system is available now with the S-Class and allowed in some markets. Um, and this is really interesting. We have an EQS driving review with an autonomous level 3 demonstration. That's very, very interesting. But you can see, didn't even touch the steering wheel. Car is being held in the lane. Very impressive. And how smooth it is, you know, like not like wobbling around and, and stuff. And still not uh, saying I have to get, no, I get the information. And oh, that even went away without me doing anything. So usually it's capacitive here, you know, the steering wheel. So I just have to touch it and then that's it. Here like this. There, there we go. And the warning message is gone actually. So very impressive how the assistance systems work here in this all new S-Class. and. The whole driving dynamics, the whole driving feeling, the calmness in the interior, this has even more been improved. And my point once again was, or is, the user interface is worse than before. Everything else, driving wise and so on, is better than before. Yeah, it's still some kind of a trade off for sure, but I mean, driving wise, the vehicle still amazes me. This is such a cool ride. Once again, the long wheelbase version or the US version V223 we are driving here now. So, especially relevant for all US viewers. And this is globally the S Class. So, they develop the S Class from this version, from the long wheelbase one, and then cut something out for the short wheelbase, basically. Usually, it's the other way around when driving, you know, when developing short and long wheelbase vehicles here, they really start with the long wheelbase. Interesting, by the way, that I see in the head up display, like a like a mark where the car in front of me is but I wonder like what is this kind of over technology um, why do I need like a like a line a digital line following the car in front of me I see that car you know I don't get it really like that's I think just playing around with technology without having much sense in it I think you know well, the car literally drives itself. <laughs> so this is also the reason you can relax pretty much here, uh, especially on long motorway rides. And ah, this soft cushion is just really amazing. At the same time, you always have enough power reserves also to do some nice accelerations as we've shown to you. And now it gets also interesting because we'll switch motorways, so from one to another. And motorway changing in Germany is, to me, more fun even than using the unlimited high speed we have at some motorways, not at all, and also not like really long parts, usually not, because these motorway changes, they are always, you know, connected with some nice curves and bends and so on. Um, this is a lot of fun, actually. So here we go. Brake feeling, by the way, also very decent. You do feel the weight of the vehicle in the corners, that's for sure can't deny that it's a big car. So if you think about, for example, S-Class versus E-Class, then the E-Class will give you more driving dynamics. And meanwhile, with all the technology packed in, so this has been a scheme um, over the last few years, you know. So, so often have we seen that the small cars already get now what the big cars are, even like really down below to an A-Class or something. So more and more features are not especially unique anymore to the very very big segments 
Yeah, that indeed speaks against going for the high spec model. I mean, some things are newly introduced, like the augmented reality head-up display and so on, and screens in the middle and some. But again, yeah, controlling that screen or the temperature while driving is really doubtful. What's not doubtful is that we still have a good acceleration, so yeah, I couldn't get so fast here in the corner, but at least now. So cancel that acceleration. Oh, leave that SUV by. Yeah, but you see here, the inner changing between accelerating and braking again is really decent. And now we're already at 200 kilometers an hour, 125 miles an hour. I mean, <laughs> especially our US fans must be like, this guy is somehow nuts because like, oh, you know, we're at 200 kilometers, 125 miles an hour. Yeah, 90% of the world's population have never driven at that speed. And this guy, oh, you know, yeah, it's Germany, it's business as usual. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes it still is. There will probably be a speed limit coming ahead in Germany and there's big discussion about it, of course. and. I always say you have to differentiate between what you like driving yourself and what is actually better for society to do. Mm, yeah, and that doesn't have, you know, to be equal always, you know. Here at higher speeds also, you know, when you shake it a little bit up, shake it up. So, yeah, you feel the air suspension is still set, set on a soft tone even if you are in a sports mode. So you feel the car is moving somewhat, but that's also let's say okay because it differentiates this vehicle, the S-Class and especially when you go to the comfort driving mode, when you have some waves inside here, you know, inside the road, then it really goes like whoa, floating like without being too exaggerated or something. But when you would have an Audi A8 or a BMW 7 Series, for example, they rather have the sporty approach also in the base version and the S-Class is more, once again, the luxury comfort focus with a rather floating air suspension. And I think as for air suspension, that's good because I enjoy, for example, like the BMW adaptive suspension is one of the best suspension there is in their big vehicles and you don't need an air suspension then actually. But when you go for an air suspension, I think the Mercedes approach is cool that you still tell the customer Hey guys, this is an air suspension. You feel it because you're like flying in the air. That's, I think, a cool approach and it has to be that way. With the AMG models by Mercedes, they still pick the air suspension nowadays and then make it so stiff that, the, is that an air suspension? Wait a minute, that's even worse in comfort than an air suspension. What is this? You know, I think that's totally unnecessary. Why would you do that? You know, then you can go for another, you know, normal steel spring or whatever, you know, or make it adaptive dampers or something. So here, once again, really relaxed feeling on the motorway and you really can have both performance and also then the relaxed feeling. And I think also the engine here is a good price performance. It will be the entry-level engine in the US once again. And the V8 will have worse fuel economy and will just add more weight to the vehicle. That's the thing, you know. So and this is already a heavy vehicle, 2.1 tons and try to keep the weight down then, try to keep it lower, or at least not push it even further, you know. So, be, because that's the thing, you know, also when you compare it to, let's say, like, go, go for an E-Class and S-Class, you have some more luxury features here, but you feel just that the car is indeed heavier. That's then the main difference. So, controlling that thing here while driving, the best thing is then to use the voice control because stuff is getting over complicated here. For example, hey Mercedes. How can I help? Start wave massage. I'm starting the wave massage for you. Thank you, so kind of you. So, ah, there it goes. Oh, no, that's the music. <laughs> so there it goes with the wave, wave massage and well, this massage program is the wave massager is the best one to me, actually, because it really goes like, you know, like in the, these dot waves and uh, across the whole body and even also, you know, on, on, the, on the seating surface there. And not all massage do that. And so that really keeps you fit also during long motorway rides. And I really, really like that. So let's switch here to the middle lane because there will be some other guys probably want to 
go faster than loud. And the good thing for us for that is we can show the blind spot monitor. Then. And there's a message GL, GLE coming up. Then we can also see the blind spot monitor in the side mirror. Here we go. There's the red triangle. And when I also hit the turning indicator, I also get the acoustic warning and also the triangle. What is this? Okay. That happened. Whatever. It's a new GLE generation. You can see it in the tail limbs. You know, they are more. more oh, it's direct competitors. I say GLE and BMW X5. So uh, both, of course, great ride. And you should check out the reviews here on the Autogefühl of these two, definitely. Yeah, people are do taking looks here, you know, we see it from time to time at the new S-Class. Well, but from the rear, you have to see now all the Mercedes sedans look kind of the same now at the rear. So it's not that much, you know, uniquely standing out or something. Um, yeah. Digital instruments, by the way. So I have a clear view. The only thing is that I'm not sure if I'm like super special as for my torso height or something. I, I think not. Be, uh, but. I tend to keep the steering wheel lower because, you know, I'm very well in control and not doing like this, you know. And also, when you want to drive a longer way but still want to, you know, have a good control of steering wheel, you can use the left armrest here and the right armrest and then you have like stable rest. You can keep the steering wheel straight and in control and when you want to attack, you just lift your arms and there we go, there we go you know. So, and for that reason, I rather keep the steering wheel a little bit lower. And then the upper part of the instruments are a little bit locked. And also there are these infrared sensors in the front of the screen saying like this, are you tired mode? And the screen is also telling me like, move the steering wheel up, Thomas. I can't see you. Wait a minute. That's actually a good, you know, privacy mode, right? So leave me alone with your something. I'm watching you. I <laughs> just put the steering wheel, like, you know, when you are, uh, in front of your laptop and you use the sticker to to uh, to to put to shut the cam off actually so uh, no one while you're doing your zoom video conference can see that you're sitting in front of your desk in you know just in shorts or something <laughs> so once again it's one of the best motorway vehicles there is so comfortable so relaxing so silent that is once again really top notch and Look at that ambient lighting. You can even see it at daytime when it's a little bit darker. I just love that ambient lighting thing. The only thing that comes above that is the Mercedes EQS. There, the even you know the, the ambient lighting looks even more kick-ass. Did I just say that? <laughs> Here I can go to Energy Shine, and this is the so-called circus mode. <laughs> Here, when I accelerate, you see um, effects. When I decelerate, nothing happens. And yeah, this is the, hey, I invite my friends over to see my cars for the very first time, driving through a tunnel or driving through a night and everyone's having a party while I'm being not distracted by my friends, nor the ambient lighting, I'm not drunk and I'm driving, everyone else can get drunk, you know? So uh, <laughs> yeah. A full driving review of the Mercedes EQS in winter conditions here. What about efficiency, range, and also charging test here today with Thomas on Autogefühl. It's one of the most expensive EVs out there, but is it also one of the best? Let's find out, let's go. In the front you can see here this closed grille with a small star pattern. That's actually quite interesting. The light strip goes all the way through. Here LED is standard. The digital light is optional. Then you can also really use individual pixels. The color for the day is depending on the market called Twilight Blue or Sodalith Blue. Well, uh, why Twilight? Because it couldn't decide if it's blue or not. <laughs> yeah, the nautical blue is, uh, you know, more bluish tone would more come close to a Thomas Blue here. The length here at 5 meters 22 or 205 inches and it has this really unique design, you have to say that really, here with this one bow design right here that goes all the way through. However, are you team ugly or are you team beautiful? I'm on team ugly here today. Vote in the comments if you like the design or not. Tell me in the comments what do you think. I would be really interested because most of the comments I've read so far is say that people say, nah, that's not really a good design. Tell me in the comments. Wheels from 19 inch, at least in Germany, up to 22 inch maximum, also special with the AMG version, but here 
21 inch wheels today with this like dual design i would call it that way in the us it's mostly 20 or 21 inch by the way eqs logo right here today chrome frames around the windows it is a very clean design and the main goal was aerodynamics indeed so it's more like form follows function rear is very interesting you have that rear axle steering 4.5 degrees in the opposite direction with the rear wheels or optional 10 degrees it's a software thing it is actually in the vehicle already but just with software you basically unleash it I don't like this trend <laughs> to you oh and there's no frunk to be opened that's not possible the HEPA filter the optional one is stored underneath that the only thing you can open here is this wiper fluid uh, fill in right here here in the rear that clean design is actually quite cool I think especially here the light signature in the rear and the small rear lip right there you have different power output versions you start with a 350 for example on the German market the small battery and rear drive here the 450 plus plus stands for the big battery but still rear wheel drive the 580 would be all wheel drive one electric motor in the front one in the rear one in the front, one in the rear, that way. <laughs> and then the EQS 53 AMG, that is basically the same and with a little bit more horsepower tune in the all wheel drive. Here, acceleration figure with this one here, around six seconds. Battery, 108 kilowatt hours net, the big one, or the smaller one, 90 kilowatt hours net. It's not too big of a difference, right? You save around like 8,000 euros then for the smaller version. In the US market, uh, the small battery will probably not be available. However, I think most of the time you will end up with the biggest battery because you just want the highest range, especially also in winter time. Recharging, 11 kilowatt AC, optional 22 kilowatt AC, and here maximum of 200 kilowatt DC. But what about the concise charging test? Theoretically, around 30 minutes from 10% to 80%. We also have here the charging curve for you. Yeah, that's very interesting because the peak is actually right there, but doesn't fall that fast. But the question is, here now also in winter time, is it really the case? We'll make the exact test right now. And now we start fast charging, 10%. Yeah, it says Porsche Engineering, this one here. 10% state of charge. Let's see how fast it goes. So charging power goes up. They have a 400 volt strategy, by the way, here. So it should go to around 400 volt. And let's see here, 200 kilowatt would be the peak power. And let's see, Do we stop here at about 173. Uh, Maybe a little bit more. Now from the inside, you can also see that, yeah, around 170 kilowatt. And the total charging time to 100% would be about an hour. But that's not the relevant one, but rather to 80%, because the last 20% takes so much more time. And very important, what I did is precondition the battery by driving motorway. And I also set this charging station in the GPS system. Then the car knows, actually, I want to approach that one. So if you would not do that, then the battery would not have the right temperature and it could be that we do not reach this high charging power. So we went a little higher to now 180, yeah, 183 kilowatt. And so after 10 minutes, we went from 10 to 36%. So that's already good. And the cool thing is really, you can see here, yes, we did not reach the peak 200 kilowatt, but here the 170 or 180 kilowatt are being held all the time here so far. That's the crucial thing. We're still at 150 kilowatts, so now it's slowly dropping from that top speed we had, but so far, still a very good result. And you have to take in mind, this is here a very big battery, one on eight kilowatt hours net. So that means like the smaller EVs with these you now like 70 to 80 kilowatt hour batteries, they would already be yeah, kind of full now. So because here, we have already delivered now 63 kilowatt hours in 20 minutes. And even here at this relatively high state, power is still over 100 kilowatt. Very impressive. So here, just over 30 minutes and 80 kilowatt hours in just over 30 minutes. That is really impressive. And you, yeah, there we are. And we've reached 80%, 31, yeah, almost 32 minutes. The key here, actually cool quality, like that, but I'm at war with the door handles. So you can press here in this, you know, 
stamped area to close it that's quite easy but then to open it I feel that sometimes it's working sometimes it's not you should press yeah this time it works but often you press like five six times and nothing happens but you can also open and close it here with the key that's also possible door closing sound frameless doors uh, yeah that's a soft close <laughs> one more time here soft close uh, yeah here now you work against that electric motor that's the thing um, uh, now and soft close Ta -da. but what is when you slam it that sounds very weird then inside of doors really cool here soft touch and also with the ambient lighting you can always see here however cost savings to me these are cost savings this is one button here see here there's one whole button for cool seats heated seats and the memory function and this is here also it doesn't give you haptic feedback like it used to be um, so it looks like it you know gives you some feedback but it doesn't so you like controlling it in thin air and I'm not sure what to think about it what I know what to think about is the Burmester sound system it's awesome indeed and also nice wooden style interior here then the bright interior looks so amazing color wise this is great in Germany you can also get Artico leatherette in here in the beige color or also in black however in the US or in the UK no animal free interior available why why are they doing this and here by the way the animal skin interior do you see this talking about quality hmm that already looks you know really like uh, 100 kilometers 100,000 kilometers used or something like this and you know I love bright interiors but bright floor mats are not a good idea and my shoes weren't that dirty but it's just especially for winter time not a good idea seating wise I would tend just to go for the base seats because these you know more luxurious seats here you can pick as an option are really two plus you feel like like the seat is like blowing you away from the seating position something like that you know that's the closest thing I can describe it you can't really feel one with the seat so this is supposed to be the electric s-class and I don't feel that well with the seating ergonomics here it's yeah recently a thing with Mercedes I think they should work on that they do work on the materials there recently seen the EQXX concept car but however the German market gets Artico animal free leather red and also microfiber in the AMG line but the US and the UK market not the flagship model of sustainable luxury should do better then headroom wise gets very close here with one meters 86 or six foot one this is also the one in here with panoramic roof which is quite amazing actually let's open it by the way when it's really hot in summertime then you can also close it the rear one also has a shade if you like okay guys before i take a seat just take a look at this shot how amazing design wise this interior looks well and now I'm disturbing the image screen wise screen screen screens 12.3 then either 12.8 s class like in the middle more vertical or optional hyper screen for more than 6,000 euros or dollars like here 17.7 inch and then you also get third screen 12.3 inch as a passenger screen this one here the hyper screen looks more amazing the base version will be a little bit easier to control here you can see also this kind of kind of like you know curved design hey mercedes how can i help what do you think about bmw close acquaintance mercedes even manufactured series car bodies for bmw in the 1930s really interesting wait a minute in 1930s uh, thin ice Mercedes <laughs> well and then here GPS looks amazing of course and especially here in the hyper screen it looks amazing again yeah they claim like a zero layer technology but sometimes you do have to go quite deep in the menu I think and this is like this app view here in the SA EQ you can see the state of charge of the battery interesting is definitely um, the settings and the comfort menu in the settings menu for example you can hear um, you know change the language and so on vehicle you can activate different sound experiences i'll test that one when we're driving how loud they are actually 
Here at Dynamic Select you have the driving modes, but you can also activate it with a hotkey in the middle console like this, sport mode, comfort mode, and so on and so on. The visualizations are indeed pretty cool. And comfort-wise, you have a very nice seat massage that really goes, especially the wave massage is great because it goes then, you know, from the top part even um, to lower to your, to your booty and so on. Yes, intensive. I'll test that one later on as well. And if you don't care about all this and just want to go with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, then you go with that one. And the sound system, as I said earlier, is awesome. And yeah, this is also one of the most classics of all time, of course, trends wise. Yeah, great sound. Here you can see this nice augmented reality function in the GPS screen. So you can see the camera image and then there is this arrow. It's a little bit laggy at the moment though, so most of the time I've also seen it in real time, but yeah, that's why we do these tests, so this can obviously also happen. The steering wheel trusts on hashtag capacitive BS for volume sliders and so on, and here you can also control the right screen with that one, and on the left side the same thing, but just done for cruise control, but it is definitely harder than with the older steering wheels where you have the rear buttons. I'm really not sure who thought of this instrument design here, because you see that leaning angle? They should be more upright like this. You can see them better. Here, these are, by the way, the IR lights. Um, you can only see them on camera. It's just too, you know, too flat. And you can see the reflections also, and they are also visible with your own eye. You can go full screen map, for example. It's not flickering in real life, just on camera, by the way, here at the moment. Um, but also here, for example, for sportier gauges. But that doesn't, you know, um, deny the fact that the integration of the instruments should have been more visible to the driver. The head-up display is really large and very good to see and also has some augmented reality function. And there it is. You can see here also augmented reality arrows in the head-up display here signaling me then to turn right here at this intersection. When ambient lighting wise, this is so cool. I think I love it and we'll drive it in a tunnel very soon and also have the active ambient lighting then. Wait for that. Interesting area here also, there is usually piano like car here. That's of course then collecting fingerprints and so on. Here, the matte wood option is really cool. I would go for that one. When you open that one, you have two USB-C charges. You can put your phone here in there. No, it's not a piece of bread. <laughs> it's a cork case. Inductive charger there, cup holders. And here then you have start-stop button. You can pick the driving modes here, for example. And then you have the typical split opening here with more space and two USB-C chargers. That looks just so nice, right? With the panoramic roof and this entry area and the uh, bright seats. Really inviting indeed. <sighs> Such a bad contrast that I now ruin again the floor mats because I already did a shoe tap and there's nothing, you know, loose underneath my shoes. But uh, yeah, the white floor mats not a good idea. And also in general, the rear here is not a good idea because do you see on camera how cramped I am here? It's like short bench and then it's like I feel like sitting like yes on the toilet. Yeah. <laughs> um, headroom wise with one with 86 or six with one, it works but gets close. I can put a hand over my head, but it's so uncomfortable here in the rear. Then this part is also so cramped. Well, knee room wise, that's not a problem at all. And also here, no middle um, tunnel and so on. You can sit here also with three tall adults. That's no problem. But the seat ergonomics here in the rear are indeed strange, I have to say. This middle part, you can also fold down. Then you have inductive charging pad and some more storage space right here. Very nice at the inside of the doors here in the rear, by the way. Contour stitches, soft materials. Also cool with the backlighting here round, but then again, the high gloss piano lacquer stuff. But the matte wood right here, that's actually very fancy. The cool thing here about the EQS is that you have this fastback style hatch. Opens very wild, so you basically have something like an estate See here with one with A6 or 6 one, I can easily stand underneath it. This cover here raises automatically and you can easily access that vast trunk. And this boot here, okay, now I covered US and UK viewers, <laughs> comprises 610 up to 1770 liters. This easily fits. The length here, 1 meters 20 or 47 inches. That's actually quite good. And the width is... Yeah, also a good meter or 40 inches um, also here in, in this area. 
and the height let's say right here for example around 45 centimeters or 18 inches and when we fold the seats you can easily score this two meters or 79 inches in length to the front seat you see it raises a little bit and there is a step but in general we again have to say loading area wise it's very very well usable acceleration from 50 kilometers an hour let's go One thirty, one fifty. Yeah, that sound experience low. And top speed soon reaching at. Ah, come on, two hundred and thirteen kilometers an hour, two hundred fourteen. So that's around one hundred thirty miles per hour. Wind noise is now picking up, of course, but still, I mean, it's quite silent here and really great in control. Air suspension stiffened up now for these higher speeds. Here also, for example, lane change. Yeah, feels really agile. Now hard on the brakes, of course, maximum recuperation as well. But now the real brakes are also being used. Whoa. And we can indeed also change this sound experience here. That was Vivid Flux. We can also go with uh, Silver Waves, for example or with roaring pulse, let's see. <laughs> but of course, it rather plays a role when you really accelerate it out, then you hear it in a more notable way. And for the next acceleration from 90 kilometers an hour, let's switch to roaring pulse. Let's listen to that. Let's go. Really great here, very settled on the motorway, long bend here. Wow. Yeah, that was already once again 200 kilometers an hour or 125 miles an hour, really good. And well, this roaring pulse, um, you couldn't hear that that well, especially probably on microphone because mixed with the wind noises because it's low frequency. Let's test your silver waves. Let's see. It's like one like whoosh, the whoosh. But Vivid Flux is definitely the most um, you know, yeah, audible one, I would say, definitely. However, with the EQS 53 AMG, that was way more audible. Let's, let's just quickly tune into that. Let's listen to that. That was something, wasn't it? So most of the time, probably, you would just leave it completely off because I also think, you know, it delivers you a sensation of speed in a way, but it gets annoying over time. 100. One fifty. Here I set it to strong, strong recuperation. Now we have to reduce the speed. Is it a one pedal driving feeling? Well, the recuperation is strong when you have set here the shifting pedals. Yes. Normal recuperation, no recuperation, normal, strong. So three levels basically. But then again, when you're driving a little bit slower, it does not make a full stop. So is it a true one pedal driving feeling then? No. Not really, but you can at least set strong recuperation. However, it is being reset it when you start the car again. So they rather set on this, you know, rolling effect um, and also using the brakes. But when I press and hold the shifting pedal, intelligent recuperation gets active here. No car in front of me, no recuperation. Then I'm closer to a vehicle. There is recuperation. So that's actually the best recuperation mode. And then you can also come to a standstill when a car is in front of you in traffic jam. Now, when we get to the tunnel, this one here is of course pretty cool. You can really see the ambient lighting. And even cooler is of course lights. Yeah, that's of course very distracting when I do something right here, ambient lighting. Wait, it's settings, why another step? So, and then here I can go to energy shine. 
and this is the so-called circus mode. <laughs> Here, when I accelerate, you see um, effects. When I decelerate, nothing happens. And yeah, this is the, hey, I invite my friends over to see my cars for the very first time, driving through a tunnel or driving through a night and everyone's having a party while I'm being not distracted by my friends, nor the ambient lighting, I'm not drunk, and I'm driving, everyone else can get drunk, you know? So, uh, yeah, that's the so-called, or we call it circus mode here. <laughs> well, it is entertaining, but of course distracting. Um, when some even say that a mono ambient lighting would even be already distracting, this one surely is. But I think the ambient lighting is pretty cool. I love, of course, to have it here in Thomas Blue. Uh, yeah, you have different options here <laughs> available and of course brightness all the way up. Air suspension is sporty and comfortable at the very same time. Remember we have the big wheels here, but indeed because the air suspension is so good, you still have decent comfort. Yeah, Tesla Model 3 here without air suspension, really, really stiff there. The rather, you know, fair compared to this one here is a Tesla Model S. That one has air suspension and also has then a good suspension comfort meanwhile with Tesla since they made the um, you know the, 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 up, the upgrades like two years ago I think for S and X so uh, yeah suspension wise is really good and of course here the rear axis steering when you're at slower speeds either it's 4.5 or 10 degrees rear axle steering 10 degrees is an option and that makes this vehicle here which you know it has 5 meters 22 in length so much more agile and faking a shorter wheelbase so um, it feels kind of unnatural a little bit because at lower speeds you really feel like your tail would be like waggling, <laughs> like shake, shake, shake. But it definitely helps in parking in and out. And this 10 degrees option even more reduces the turning circle by a meter. So um, that's of course really impressive for such a, um, such a big vehicle. Ooh, one more time here, ambient lighting <laughs> in the tunnel. Malibu sunset is also one of my favorite things. I wouldn't leave it like all the time, but just, you know, getting in the mood, like cocktail beach mood or something. So that's really cool for that. Uh, or burning blue, ooh. But definitely my favorite setting is still the ocean blue. Here, once again, not too loud, wind noises, very connected to the road. In the S mode, the air suspension gets a little bit stiffer really good to control so superb in the handling suspension rise great job steering is also fine there's no big dead zone area or something and maybe in the very low degree angles they made it more in a comfort setting that you can cruise straight on the motorway for example and then when we get off the throttle we can also have here the cruise control and also with the active lane keeping assist now the speed is already being reduced and see and see how actively we are kept in the lane. Yeah, that's a very smooth process. So the assistance systems here are really top-notch. Blind spot monitor is also included. However, if I drive here so fast on the motorway, you will hardly ever see the blind spot monitor being activated because we are appearing in the blind spot, <laughs> not everyone else. So we're getting off the motorway now. Yeah, this car is so much fun to drive still. It is huge, it is large. It has a long wheelbase, but due to that rear axle steering and low center of gravity, wow, it's really great in the slalom. And of course, even better than when I drive a little bit slower because then the rear axle steering is going in the opposite direction. At higher speeds, it's going in a parallel direction. And now I, really, yeah, now I realize that the slower we get, the more active the rear axle steering goes in the opposite direction. Yeah, so hardly ever we could have so much driving fun and agility in a car at that size and at that weight. This is the most remarkable thing about this vehicle here. As for energy consumption, by the way, at top speeds, usually, you know, we also had it here now, it's like double or more than double the usual average consumption, you know, so, uh, and that would kind of mean you could drive with full speed, yeah, some little bit less than 200 kilometers or 125 miles, something like that. Because the normal average consumption we have today is also quite astonishing and rather bad, because 
we end up some 25 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers or 40 kilowatt hours on 100 miles. And that would mean we are more in like 430 kilometers of range or 270 miles. Here in winter time, close to freezing temperatures, 1.5 degrees Celsius. And that's quite astonishing because in summertime, we could score in the EQS something close to 600 kilometers or 400 miles. So the temperature effect seems to be quite heavy on this vehicle. Yeah, that's a thing you're gonna have to live with. And of course, thinking about, hey, say like, I have enough money. I will just want the best electric vehicle with the highest range and so on. Well, it seems that you do not have the greatest advantage here from this 100K plus vehicle, 100K in the base version, 160 or something equipped. And then if you compare this to this like 60,000 euros or dollars EVs like Kia EV6, Ford Mustang Mach-E, Tesla Model Y, well, in the winter times, they don't differ that much in range. That's of course also one of the key finding here today. Very interesting. Here, by the way, now, second traffic light. Once again, you have the traffic light view. Well, in this case, I can see it, but here now green, and now I accelerate out, and here, nice rear axis steering, and ah, yeah, in sport mode, it gets a little bit, you know, it doesn't break out any rear or something, but it gets a little bit loose. You have, of course, a lot of, lot of power, and to me, when you have these vehicles which are available with rear-wheel drive or with all-wheel drive, even if the rear-wheel drive ones have less power and one electric motor less, in efficiency it doesn't matter though, so much actually with the electric vehicles. Not like when you go like a rear or front-wheel drive versus all-wheel drive with a combustion engine. However, from the agility, when you have rear-wheel drive only, you have just a boost from the rear wheels and it is more fun to me. Yes. It's less in the excavation, but we've seen on the motorway, this one here, the 450 is way more than enough. To me, it's the version to go for with the EQS, because the 350 available in Germany, for example, has the smaller battery, so go for the one with the bigger battery, but then with rear-wheel drive to have more fun. And especially when you set it here to the normal driving mode, the electronic stability control will also control that it won't break out in winter or something. All-wheel drive just makes sense when you live like, you know, in the Alps region in Europe or Minnesota in the US or something, or in Canada, in BC or something like this, then the all-wheel drive will still make sense, yes, but for most use cases, rear-wheel drive will just be enough and you can save you know, some money with it. And to me, indeed, you have a little bit more driving fun. As for seating and so on, I felt, I told you that in the interior part, I feel that the seat is for some time too plush in a way. They look super comfortable and sophisticated, but I don't feel that they offer so much comfort as they should be. So, especially recently, I'm not really satisfied with the seat ergonomics with Mercedes in general. Maybe just my body type, why, but um, I've read it also in the comments that a lot of you guys actually um, also said, yeah, Thomas, finally talk, someone talks about this. I have the same experience. I'm especially, um, you know, all of you who, who are a little bit taller say like, don't really feel comfortable in the Mercedes seats. I'd rather go than, you know, for Lexus, Audi, BMW. Um, VW Group in general, by the way, is usually building seats which have, you know, a higher average. Whereas Mercedes and also the um, Asian manufacturers rather go for a lower average in, in um, you know, in, in, in a seat, um, seat form as for the body height. That's always a problem, you know, with setting the averages. It's also discriminating women most of the time because like a typical male average is usually taken. That's in automotive industry. It's in pharmaceutical sort of stuff. Um, so that's also a big issue, of course. Yeah. And... When you're very tall, then you're also discriminated against. <laughs> yeah, okay, but okay, I'll survive here, but I have to say, this car costs so much and supposed to be so comfortable, but to me, it isn't actually. And when you now compare Mercedes S-Class versus EQS, they apply the same uh, raw chassis foam that kind of builds up during the process then here on the EQS. Still, I felt that the S-Class is a little bit more silent, really at very, very high speeds when we've driven that one. That's also an interesting factor. Driving fun-wise, EQS versus S-Class, 
clearly the EQS, so much more fun with a low center of gravity. It's really the thing, you know, in all the segments, the electric vehicles are more fun to drive, minus possible sound or something um, when, you, when you think about that. And now some agile driving fun here with the Silver Waves sound profile. Here in the sport mode, again, suspension a little bit silver, but the air suspension evens that out very well. More comfort, of course, than with some smaller wheels possible also. And you really don't feel that you would be steering such a long vehicle. Yeah, and with rear-wheel drive, you can very well get out of the corners. <laughs> you hear something of the sound profile. Now on the brakes, there you feel the weight, actually. Yeah, a little bit breaking out even. Great fun, wow. And one more time. <laughs> this is so great, really. I mean, I'm not deactivating ESC here on public roads or something, but this was already enough. Can have a little spin, yeah. This so much proves my point that the rear-wheel drive version of this one here of the EQS is so much more fun than the all-wheel drive version, especially in these conditions here and these situations. Yeah, and then you can just live with a little bit less of acceleration boost when you have more cornering driving fun, definitely. That's at least my take to this. The Genesis G80 wants to challenge the German premium market. Recently, we've seen the French attack with the DS9 on Mercedes E-Class, BMW 5 Series and Audi A6. Now the Korean attack. And the question is, is it better than the Mercedes E-Class and its German premium competitors and I've driven over 1,000 vehicles in my reviewing time. I'm not easily impressed, but can this car impress me? We will find out. Let's start with the front. Genesis G80 here with a meshed front grille in chrome. Wow, what a look. And the sensor here is very well integrated. It keeps the structure here, but still they have a good cover for the sensors that are behind it and they can keep the 3D logo on the top. Genesis, a premium brand of the Hyundai Corporation. They put the Ionic brand as their electric brand and Genesis as their premium brand. And now they are also back in Europe. They have tackled the US market so far. There has good feedback from that. Therefore, I was really interested. Now they try it on the European market, which is, of course, a very fierce competition. Headlamps, LED is standard and the data running light here in the horizontal way, so a very sporty look, sportier than a Mercedes E-Class, for example, I think. The length here is at 5 meters or 197 inches, even 5 centimeters longer than a Mercedes E-Class, and I give way for the side, wow, look at that. I mean, what a cool side profile. 18 to 20 inch wheels, these are the big 20 inch wheels, and I think a massive design here with chrome, and it's a very flat design, so to speak, here. The headlamps in the front, are also somewhat mirrored in these side elements here. Oh, so very interesting. And then my favorite for this side profile is definitely this almost coupe-ish line. So it doesn't have a classical sedan line. It's more like a somewhat coupe fastback ending right here. And that's what I find really, really cool. And that also sets it apart, you know, from the competitors. And to the rear, once again, they keep the continuous design right here with this horizontal structure also for the tail lamps. Very impressive, so I think a very consistent design like that. And a look for the auto fuel fake exhaust police, not entirely fake because the tip is fake and the rear exhaust on the inside, but of course, somewhat. They have rear wheel drive models and also all wheel drive models. And this one is the petrol test today, but they also come with the all electric version of the G80. That's of course also massive. And turning indicator check here, this dual scheme, this is really attractive. And even at the side right there, spectacular. And also here in the rear, this dual layout, very well visible. And I really have to say guys, now that the rain is picking up, the connotation, look at that car once again. Doesn't it look a little bit like a Bentley in the front with the front grille and the English rain? And also, you know, this front three quarter view as well, but especially then with the grille. But that was from the rear. To me now, it really gets the Bentley design. Or what do you think? And talking about the EV version with an 87 kilowatt hour battery, supposed range something 400 kilometers, 250 miles, and Fastest in acceleration, less than five seconds. If you want to see the G80 EV here on our channel as well, 
put it in the comments. Then the other engines, there will be a 3.5 liter V6, an almost equal acceleration figure around five seconds, just like the EV version with two electric motors. And then there's here the 2.5 liter turbo, the smaller petrol engine, around six seconds with a three and horsepower version. We have today here a little bit more, six and a half with a 250 horsepower version. And then there's also a 2.2 liter diesel, but that won't play a big role. These cars are about the details. That's why we on Autogefühl also pay attention to details. <laughs> so let's switch to the interior. I was really impressed by the exterior and it can easily catch up with the German manufacturers. I think it's even more attractive in a way. It's more unique and we've been driving around and that really gets the looks like, what car is that? So it's definitely more unique, but can the interior catch up at this price point? This car starts below 50,000 US dollars or below 50,000 euros, whereas the E-Class usually starts in most markets higher than 50,000 dollars and higher than 50,000 euros. So at that price point, can they catch up with the interior? Let's see. Soft touch at the top part here, then matte wood use here. Hear that? Mm, beautiful. Then inside of doors, also plush materials, galvanized buttons with some knurling effect. So that's awesome. Memory seating. This is of course not the base entry version. No press test vehicle is ever in the base version. So this is of course not below $50,000 here, but still it will be cheaper than the E-Class. Yeah, I mean design of the steering wheel, I think that's maybe the only thing here that is a little bit of a let off because, I don't know, it looks so old school, you know, the design of the steering wheel is super old school, I think. So that is to criticize design wise, or what do you think? Tell me in the comments. But here, the quality of the buttons here on the steering wheel, that's awesome. And the Germans are moving to the capacitive buttons on the steering wheel, which is BS to control while driving. So I'm really glad we still have normal buttons to press here while driving at the steering wheel. And one of my favorite features here, this knurling here at the turning indicator, star column, that's awesome. So really good build quality already with that. As for the seats, they look really luxurious. So far, only animal skin materials available, but they told me when they are about then here to launch the G80 EV, they will also present some alternatives. They promised to us because Obviously, the animal skin leather, it's not good for the animals. It's also a lot of energy and resource use as well, and also for the workers involved. And the alternatives nowadays, you can have the very same feeling, use recycled materials, not even new petroleum use. And if you have new petroleum share, then it's like so little that it's nothing in comparison to petrol use of a car or something. So the alternatives are there. You just have to offer them to the customer you can get the same feeling, but just with less impact on everyone. And that's, you know, what they have to do here. That's where they are lacking behind a little bit. But we see and keep you updated what's to come right there. Seating position itself, the ergonomics of the seat, top notch, really comfortable. Steering wheel, in and out, up and down. And like you listen to the electric motors of the seat and so on, this is really silence. You can hardly pick that up when you here have the seat control. This is also a seat massage function here. So let me turn on the ignition and let's test that one. So I like to pay attention to those details, especially in these luxury cars. And we used to say, sometimes when you have like these really extremely loud electric motors of small functions, it's like, like ah, what's going on here? But here it's really subtle. The seat massage here is actually quite nice, but that one I have to say, mm, feels a little bit more elaborate with Mercedes, but it's already quite cool because it's also keeping, you know, keeping you a little bit in movement from the lower seating area and not only at the back. Then, one means a six, six foot one, a lot of headroom left. This one here without the panoramic roof. And I mean, this Alcantara or microfiber ceiling, beautiful. And I mean, look at that. Everything you touch and see, this is high class build quality, top notch, I have to say, the first interior impression, I'm super impressed. And once again, that doesn't happen often. My first impression is, is it maybe even better than the Germans? Interior overview, once again, really impressive. Besides the steering wheel, I mean, I want to know what, what you guys think. Do you also think it's a little bit like color-wise, it perfectly fits? But from design, I think 
it's too old school in comparison to the other things. Or what, what do you think? What do you see in the steering wheel? But instruments, pretty fancy, 8 inch or optional 12.3 inch 3D instruments, really a three dimensional look, doesn't really come on camera. Two more deals to that. It's really interesting, I can promise. Then, here in the middle part, 14.5 inch horizontal screen. That looks really impressive. Also, some more details to that. Soft touch here. Then, once again, my favorite matte wood. Wow, I mean, this is one of the best build qualities I've seen so far. This is really awesome. And we still have hotkeys, so not everything wire touch. That's cool. And also, yes, yay, <laughs> we have the manual climate knobs with nice display on the inside. So that's also easy to control. And here, this is in the touchscreen, but this is for the vent strength and you can still easily control that. No problem here also with the cool seats, heated seats. Heated steering wheel in the lower area. You can s slide this one open and also hear how it resonates from the quality. Can we take a moment of silence for this? So smooth. And then you have USB chargers, USB A in the front. An inductive charging pad with the phone, but for Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, you need the cable connection here. Then volume knob here and some hotkeys. And this is a little bit strange. I mean, the clicking sound is great and it looks awesome. However, this is here to control the infotainment system and you can press like this or you can then turn. And actually, you rather want something like this. This is the shifting lever, which is also cool. But you want to have something this, you know, as a control knob and not like, I mean, you doing this is strange. You can't really touch it and then maybe you slide over it. So doing the DJ like it's not suitable to control the infotainment system, I think. And if you want to reach over by touch, it's, you know, not, it's, it's actually too far away than here. Cup holders, also adaptive, driving mode selector. So again, once again, high build quality and this one here, the armrest opens in a split way. And you can remove this then, 12 volt power supply. Details to the infotainment system. So now it looks quite fluent, but I have to again like this, you know, use this DJ function on the on the knob in the middle console. And this is like a screensaver menu, which looks super fancy. And this is the main menu you can go through. Super wide screen. You can also use touch, but then you have to like reach over quite far. So while driving, that's not recommended. Let's take a look at the map. It looks quite impressive, mm, but still they have this kind of old software and see it's also not that responsive. So yeah, I think this should be better for this vehicle the software of the infotainment system and the user interface, this is where they can still work on, definitely. Seat control here, let's take a look at that. Here you can also you know, take a look at these controls right there, nice visualizations as well. In the sports mode, by the way, the bolts are a little bit you know, stiffer then, that's also a cool feature. And let's take a look at the Apple CarPlay and the integration looks like this still have like a map split screen. That's actually quite good use of this horizontal screen. And let's listen to the music sound system here. And yeah, that's decent. Pretty clear and also three-dimensional sound. Thomas music proof. Digital instruments, not as high in the resolution as the main screen, but really fancy. You cannot see the 3D effect. That's just for the human eye. But what you can see is when we change the driving modes, Look at that. Then also the scheme here of the instruments change. And in the middle part, you can also then change a little bit, you know, what you want to see right there. And the head-up display is a good option. Really large and very crystal clear to see. And I have to show you this. Just imagine your key falls down there. This is like, you know, a very famous spot. Wait a minute. It's not lost. Look at that. This is such a great idea. There's a bolstering inside here. So things don't fall in there. You know, every car owner has tried to like, oh, I need to get this out. But here it can't happen. Only if it falls behind this ball string. That wouldn't be too good. Not to forget, the car key looks like this. These are the remoting parking functions. And that way you can also remotely start up the vehicle. This will be very interesting. And then, of course, famous and cool door closing sound. Really subtle. And this one also equipped here with a Soft close, and that works both for the front door and also here for the rear door. Now the rear seating area. This is also where luxury sedans 
have the clash and see which one is best. Once again, the matte wood inside here. This is also one of my favorite features. Looks so great, it feels great. It doesn't leave fingerprints, awesome. Then, manual shade here, I don't know what's for the kids, for example, or for the CEOs, or for the CEO kids, I don't know. <laughs> and then, look at that, the interior. This is, first of all, we start with the seating position behind me driving. So how much legroom is there left with the length of the vehicle? Let's see. And this is normal in this segment. You still have some legroom left. However, this, you know, these segment vehicles here, they have not a good usage of space, so to speak, but also very luxurious seating position. That's cool. Here you have an additional mirror you can fold out like this. This is awesome. So, oh, do I look pretty today? You rate that better than me. <laughs> but also again, what a great quality, like when you put that in again and also like the, the, the feedback you get just acoustically. Wow. Once again, microfiber seating, so cozy in this interior. You have the rear seat entertainment right there. I'm not a fan of these rear seat entertainments because of crash safety in general. And I mean, everyone wants to use their iPads anyway. Uh, who wants to use this? I'm not sure if that is really um, that useful. You can check out the camera of the vehicle here in the rear as well, all the different cameras. That's maybe funny that the kids can play around with that. And what's also cool, you can move the seat here with this middle console, so move it a little bit more forward and so on. But this is rather a function I want to use behind this seat there, when I'm behind the co-driver or the passenger, which is in this case not present, but here. Very good that they thought of these controls. Here you can move the seat then forward, and they're also like this. And now we can then by this create us the best seating position here as being chauffeured. So I switched the seats now and recently in a DS9 episode, we said, you know, in the movies like the UK chauffeurs, they're always called James. And we asked how are the French chauffeurs are being called? And we had like some results not saying like Jean or Jacques or something. Question to our Korean fans, how are chauffeurs in Korean, in, in Korea called actually? It's like, I don't know, you know, you tell me in the comments, but maybe also then, you know, in, in English letters, not in Korean letters, so we can all read it. <laughs> Looking forward to that. So. I mean, that is, we're comparing it against the E-Class, right? This is, you know, rather coming close to S-Class. Huge middle tunnel here, of course, you see. You know, there are also all-wheel drive models and the other models are rear-wheel driven. So this is really blocking. But I mean, it's the two-seat setup here anyway. You can use the middle seat, yes. So this is possible like this, but it's quite stiff here and not, yeah, it's not laid out for that rather emergency seat. I want to enjoy this luxury position. Here I move the seat all the way to the front and then you can also use this console here. You have then the cup holders like this. And once again, buttons here for the seat heating in the rear, for the seat cooling in the rear and not like this screen all over the place. Once again, you have this control here. It, I mean, clicking sounds, once again, cool. But I think just when it comes up more and then you have something to turn, it's better than like, doing the DJ once again. This is here, another space, USB and also headphones. And look at that, another detail right there I found really peculiar. So that you don't see the interior here that much where there's nothing to look at. Here they put a cover here, which is connected to the armrest like this to cover the space up, beautifully done. And ski hatch is right there. So you can also load things through. Yeah, and once again, since you can adjust the seat here, you can put a sleeping position like this. And, hmm, Jonas, you want to drive today? So I just stay here and, um, yeah, play with the cameras or play here also with the, with the rear sunshade. Here we go. Set it up, sunshade down. Homer Simpson would enjoy this. And let's try out the remote parking function. It's been very interesting. So I hold down the button right here, the camera and parking button. And let's slowly drive and see. There's a parking spot right next to us. Yeah, the vehicle got it right there. And also that's a parking box or parallel parking, but realize it's parking box. So here we go. And then I can actually decide, do I want to do the remote parking from outside or do I want it from the inside? In this case, I want to start from the inside. So I have to hold down 
the parking button here mm. once again and now I release the brake and the car is what the f okay that happened <laughs> Yeah, that wasn't exactly the parking spot. I tried it several times, didn't work. Now I found another parking spot and then the car did realize that. So let's see. Once again, I hold down the button. Now release the brake pedal and let's see what the car does now. Here we go. So I'm doing nothing but holding the parking button now. What is the car doing? Here we go. Oh, that's actually quite fast. Hmm. Um, yeah. But it doesn't look too bad. There we go. Now, going in the front. A little bit weird though, of course. The question is really, I mean, with the other parking spot, I tried it several times, didn't work. And if you get frustrated by such a system, like one or two times, will you use it anymore? Here in this case, it works. There we go. And we are inside the parking box. So this time it worked. Now let's get it out again, but without me sitting on the inside. So I hold this button then, and then the, the car remotely comes to life. That's actually pretty cool. And now I can press the forward button and hopefully the car comes towards me. Come on, use the force, young Padawan. Here we go. Do or do, or do not, there is no try. And yeah, this obviously works and probably I should, yeah, stop it now. <laughs> Don't go to the other vehicles, right? So this is a cool function when it's really very narrow and yeah, by that way, I can now get easily in the car. So that's actually a cool function. And I think it's also a little bit more reliable than like complicated parking maneuvers. So this would be one of the use cases when you have like a narrow garage or something to get the car in and out rather than a straight way. The other commandos I would rather still do myself. Welcome to Thomas's luxurious driving lounge. And this G80, the turbo petrol engine, 2.5 liter four cylinder. You go for this one for a lower entry price not for better fuel economy, because fuel economy here, yeah, 10, 11 liters on one kilometers, barely 20 mbg US, barely 20, 25 mbg UK. So that's not good at all. I think then you can also go for the 3.5 liter V6, right? Or then maybe at some point when you have the electric version, which we also want to present to you here on our channel. But today, actually the entry level version, as for the engine, not for the whole interior and the first thing that comes to my mind what a relaxed driving feeling is nice turning indicator sound and also you know how it feels to use the turning indicator they use the ECS electronically controlled suspension so it foresees also what's coming ahead so and then it adapts accordingly that's very interesting and it's working very well so you really have this you know somewhat flying effect it's very soft. At the same time, you know, it, it doesn't shake up too much when I'm going in the slalom here. It's actually quite okay. The steering wheel, pretty responsive and also gives me a direct feeling of the vehicle. So that's also pretty good. And the driving modes also change accordingly. So when I'm here in a normal driving mode or an eco driving mode, less throttle input, then I can switch the driving mode to comfort mode, which is the instruments. A little bit more throttle input, still very comfortable for the steering wheel. And then the Sport, the bolsters here on the seat get a little bit stiffer than interesting. Red instruments, sporty design, a little bit more feedback from the steering wheel. Let's see, try it again, Sport. Yeah, it gets more loose in the other modes. And also more throttle input than in the Sports mode. But the main focus here of the car is definitely the comfort and I mean, great seating position really super calm in the interior so great noise insulation as well what we realized is it gets quite hot easily in this vehicle so when it's standing in the sun outside although there's no panoramic roof it gets really hot very quickly by all the glass areas and so on not sure what the reason of that is 
maybe also because the heat cannot escape the vehicle since there's such a good insulation. Then, what's also nice, uh, when we have this, this home screen of the, of the menu, you know, we have a little bit of like raining surrounding and so on. And it's also displayed here, you know, with a thunderstorm and so on. That's actually quite cool. So a very, very fancy home screen as for that. So I'm really feeling at home and comfort wise, I have to say it can easily indeed catch up with a Mercedes E-Class. Actually, I think it feels somewhat similar in driving like a normal Mercedes E-Class, whereas the Audi A6 and the BMW 5 Series more set emphasis on a sporty note, more driving agility. This year really wants to orient on the Mercedes E-Class and driving wise, so far, it does it very well. An additional safety mechanism here, left turning signal, you see the left side camera, right turning signal, you see the right camera. That's actually a good safety mechanism. It's an addition to the blind spot monitor and then you can also have this camera image as an additional safety net. So very good idea and it's always interesting to see how it switches then left and right. And the ultimate test, unlimited speed here at German motorway. We're already at 90 kilometers an hour, so like 55 miles an hour. Let's go. kilometers an hour wow still very calm and subtle on the road let's do a lane change like this easily mastered wind noise haven't picked up majorly so that's very well done I think the ultimate Germanish test yeah also did prevail in this one here but the sound by the way sound actuator here in the 2.5 liter turbo four-cylinder engine I mean, here at about uh, six seconds is still a decent acceleration figure for the 300 horsepower all-wheel drive version. But of course, not the most performant one. There, the V6 will perform better and of course, also the electric version. But here on the motorway, that's also where it has to face the challenge against the E-Class. And while well, 20 kilometers an hour, so 70 miles an hour around that, this is definitely also a good motorway speed, both for German and also for US highways. And Actually very subtle on the road, calm, collected, noise insulation is also good. At lower speeds, it's extremely silent. Here now at higher speeds, yeah, I think maybe the E-Class is still a little bit more silent in there, but still very relaxed driving feeling. And also the assistance systems, we can set it here. Yes, with hard buttons in the steering wheel, that's better than in the E-Class now and set the speed and also activate or deactivate the steering assist. And let's see, is it smooth and flawless here? Yeah, holding me in the lane of your, of course, you should keep your hands on the steering wheel. That's actually quite good. Traffic sign recognition telling me it's 80, but it does not adapt the cruise control to that. The car was reducing the speed because of the car in front of me. It's still showing me the speed I have set earlier. So traffic sign recognition, the connection to setting the speed, that is not included right here at the moment. So I think they should also include that. Only with steady motorway driving, with cruise control, like 100 kilometers, 120 kilometers, like 60, 70 miles, then we could score 8.3 liters on one kilometers. That's then more 30 mpg US, 35 mpg UK. Now we are once again approaching a tunnel. Let's see here all the instruments are also illuminated and so on. Wow, I mean, I'm really super relaxed in this vehicle and this is definitely one of the key competitors now in the luxury sedan market. I've been impressed with the exterior, been impressed with the interior build quality as well. And the driving test was something, you know, a lot of cars can keep up then with the German premium manufacturers. But in the driving test, they, they quite often fail because of the driving dynamics or maybe like noise insulation and so on. But this gives a super luxurious feeling, yet at the same time, when you put to the sports mode, 
it's really more aggressive and also when you do a lane change in the sports mode and so on it feels sportier the steering feeling is generally good i have to say but there can be a little bit more connection car driver and road so this is something could fix a little bit a new player on the large ev sedan market is the genesis g80 ev here with thomas on autogefühl for you how good is it actually and how does it compete against the competitors let's go the genesis g80 is somewhat like a korean mercedes e-class and usually it also comes as a combustion engine, has an open front grille, but here it's all the way closed in this EV version, still a striking look. Sometimes people mistake the design and also the logo for a Bentley. What's your take on that? Here, horizontal design for the data running like, overall a very strong design in the front here and looks really high class, doesn't it? Well, usually I'm running into the shot in the side profile this time the car rolls into the shot <laughs> because this is this remote parking feature really interesting you can use it with the key fob and then getting it in and out of some very narrow parking lots for example let's open it and that the side mirrors come up yeah it's about five meters or 197 inches in the length full size sedan really beautiful silhouette here indeed in this case this g80 ev is also equipped with the solar roof and they promise up to a surplus range of 1000 kilometers or 600 miles per year when the car is in the sun frequently and the ev always comes with 19 inch wheels a clean design here also at the rear with the horizontal stress of the tail lamps so overall i think a very very elegant design for this vehicle top speed here of the ev version is 225 kilometers now or 140 miles per hour does this go even a little bit faster well, we are going to find out today on the German Autobahn test indeed. 4.9 seconds is the acceleration figure that's quicker even than the 3.5 liter six cylinder you can get on the combustion side. All wheel drive, one electric motor in the rear or on the rear axle and one in the front. Is there a frunk? No, there is not. But it looks quite fancy under the hood, doesn't it? And the charging port for that 87 kilowatt hour battery is here behind the grill hidden interesting right with quick dc charging and thanks to the 800 volt architecture it works in about 21 minutes to charge from 10 to 80 percent state of charge that is super quick door closing sound mm, beautiful very solid but this one here is also equipped with the soft close Ooh. seating position basically the seat is comfortable but there's a big catch to that because of this EV version here, they put the batteries in the floor and then you do lose height here in the whole interior. So the seating is a little bit off if you compare it to the G80 combustion and where it was super comfortable. I feel that I'm somehow sitting higher and with 1 meters 89 or 6 foot 2, I'm almost, you know, having, you know, like my head into the ceiling here. That's really weird. Headroom still works though, yes. But, you know, I feel that I'm actually higher than the top of the windshield. So, and this is yeah, almost a deal breaker for the EV version for tall people, actually. Steering wheel, up and down, electric way. That's easy and nicely done. Yeah, if you're not as tall as me, it might not be a problem. But, yeah, it's really rare that we have still these differences between ICE and combustion, uh, between ICE and EV versions that you really sit differently. As for the seats, they look quite luxurious, but here in the EV version, only available with animal skin, that is so yesterday, the combustion engines, they do offer a high-grade leatherette. Why not here? Interior overview, elegant design, nice matte wood here, that looks amazing indeed. 14.9 inch, super wide spread screen indeed, 12.3 inch instruments. The steering wheel looks a little bit too traditional to me from that form. I think a little bit more modern would have been better in that case. And very important, manual climate unit. Here we go. So easy to control it while driving. Real haptic feedback. I love that. Here the vent strength in the screen, but that's actually fairly easy to do. And here, for example, also the cooled or the heated seats and the heated steering wheel. And some real hot keys here above that. So that's good to have that. A little bit further down below, here's like this open, good quality that you know feels really nice. 
USB-A charging for your smartphone, but also inductive charging would be possible, but you need a cable for the CarPlay or Android Auto. And then here, home button, for example, menu button for the top infotainment screen, you can control it also here, but that's so flat and you can't really touch it like this hardly. It doesn't feel that good. You press it on the inside to change something. I think they would rather need something like this for the infotainment system, but they try to differentiate these. But in the GV60, they already found a solution that you can still have something better to grab here. This is then the gear selection here for driving, neutral, reverse, or then parking. And on the right side, beautiful matte wood structure once again for the adaptive cup holders. And this is the drive mode button. And middle console here has a split opening and then some more space underneath and 12 volt power supply. Let's take a look at the infotainment. You usually control it from below. But you can also use the touch, but it's a far reach from the driving position. This is the Apple CarPlay and an auto integration, and this Lexicon sound system also yeah, makes for a very nice true sound. I really like that indeed. And as I said, you can also go back to the home menu like this. This is a nice screensaver, by the way. If you go here, that looks pretty beautiful. But controlling it while driving, um, as I said, with the problem that you always, you know, turn it that flatly, it's not the easiest thing to do. What's interesting here in the EV view, here, for example, you can also access information to the solar roof. And we can see it has already generated almost 39 kilowatt hours. So like almost half of the battery of one full battery charge. So it does bring you something back depending on how often your car is actually standing outside in the sun. Digital instruments, they switch according to the driving mode. Here, for example, in the sports mode, well, there's also the eco mode, reduced throttle input then. And you can change at least some of the contents on the inside, but actually not too much. What's rather interesting is that when you use the turning indicators, you have then here this camera view also for turning an additional blind spot warning, so to speak. And you can also get a head-up display. Rear seating is quite cozy, but you don't have too much legroom considering the length of the vehicle. And the recess would only work when you would have to seat a little bit higher. So not ideal as for the usage. And also here in the rear, you lose headroom if you compare it to the combustion engine here. Yeah, it directly fits, but I don't have any space above my head. And I did have with the combustion engine model. And you also feel that it's you know, your feet a little bit higher. You see this angle here. So yeah, big drawback here for the EV version of this vehicle indeed. And well, it's quite cool that you have the shades here, for example, in the rear, these, um, these manual shades here um, like this to, you know, another protection against the sun. They are quite hard to put up again, though. In the middle part, seating is not that ideal. And you can also have this executive seating here on the other side. This is also a practical thing that you can move then here the co-driver seat forward for that, for example, from here with these separate buttons. And then you can make yourself even more space than here on this side. That's actually a quite cool thing to have. And then you have plenty of space. Here, this middle part, you can also fold down. And then you have this additional console, for example, also for seat heating, some more space here, USB-C charging. And you also have this rear seat entertainment system, which is then kind of mirroring what you can also see in the front. You can access the map and so on. A very cool feature here with Hyundai Genesis Kia vehicles is, a lot of models have it now, you approach the vehicle with the key in your pocket only, and you don't have to use a foot kick opening mechanism, you just stand still here and the take it opens then. That's a very practical thing. But there is a catch to this EV also with the trunk. You lose 70 liters if you compare it to the combustion engine version. Here, cabin trolley vertical way does fit. You have about a meter or 40 inches in length. In width here, it's here, a meter or 40 inches, a little bit wider here, and then a little bit narrower there. But here, you see this large step here. Hmm, so considering you have such a big vehicle with such a tri tiny trunk, disappointing then. Charging cable and underneath is some more space, but not too much. Thomas's driving lounge with the G80 EV. We'll put it the sports mode and accelerate from around 40 kilometers an hour to, let's see, let's go. <laughs> 100. 150. 
200 kilometers an hour, 125 miles an hour, and soon reaching the top speed, officially 225 in kilometers, like 140 miles, and we can go a little bit further, 230, uh, 235, 236, wow. Yeah, it's not really meant to, for high-speed driving, suspension-wise, although we have electronically controlled suspension, but it feels a little bit loose in high-speed driving, definitely not set out for that. Noise insulation wise, you heard that was quite well done. It wasn't too loud though. So that was actually quite interesting. This one also is equipped with active noise cancellation, which to me is not the best thing because sometimes you might feel you have like a vacuum next to your ear or something. Um, it's not that strong here in this vehicle. So shouldn't be afraid of that. In other vehicles, for example, in Mercedes S Class Maybach, or in the, um, in the Ford Kuga, um, there I felt it was like too much. You know, here I think they found a quite good solution for that. In the Sport mode, by the way, also the bolts are a little bit stronger than here in the tunnel. Well, we cannot see too much of the ambient lighting because as soon as there is some light from the outside, you can't really see too much of that. I've set everything on the max level and you can see you can't see too much. It, there, there is ambient lighting, yes, but not too much and also not too strong. That is actually not their philosophy. When we pick another driving mode, by the way, I click it through in the middle console and it changes in the instruments. Combat mode also changes some instrument styling there. And the throttle in, uh, input is changing. Steering input, let's see, I'm in that sport mode. Steering is always very soft, actually. Let's see here, comfort. Sport, yeah, maybe a little bit more resistant, but always really light that steering, so the whole car doesn't convey a sporty feeling. That's also not what it's set out to to do. So if you compare, it, for example, to the main competitor, the Mercedes EQE, then the EQE is always set on a sportier note, just from the feeling, from the suspension, and so on. This one here more for relaxed driving through. That also leads me to the consumption figure or the real-world driving range, which, which is very interesting indeed. So now, of course, it's acceleration, then the consumption is up. And usually you can calculate with electric vehicles that the energy consumption at top speed, like 200 kilometers an hour, 125 miles an hour or something, when you reach these kind of speeds, then usually energy consum consumption is doubling from the normal or minimum figure. Yeah, so it's really, really expensive then to drive such high speeds then. And the normal energy consumption, this is by the way the blind spot monitor, the normal energy consumption is you can calculate with some 19 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers, so some 30 kilowatt hours on 100 miles. And that leads here, I have an 87 kilowatt hour net battery, and that leads to a real world driving range of some good 450 kilometers or 280 miles, which is decent for electric vehicles out there. You can score better figures if you really like do like 80, 100 kilometers an hour, 60 miles an hour, motorway, cruise control, that's it, or city driving only. Remember, combustion engines are always less efficient in the city. The EVs are always more efficient in the city. So EVs have lower average consumption figures if you go city only whereas combustion ends have higher consumption figures, city only. And on, um, on the motorway, it's basically then the other way around. That's, that's very interesting, especially in the higher the speed goes, actually. So overall, it still conveys driving fun. It is really spontaneous from the acceleration. It is quicker than the combustion engine brothers. Here, 4.9 seconds in the acceleration figure to one kilometer or 62 miles an hour. So it is fun to drive, yes, but Steering feel, as I said, is a little bit vague. Then the car also doesn't feel sporty um, as for suspension, but it feels comfortable. And that's an important thing about this vehicle. That's also the main goal, that it's comfortable, and the suspension is comfortable indeed. So it evens out the bumps very well. So I'm really happy with the suspension, and it's totally okay that the emphasis of this vehicle is not sportiness, but rather this gliding effect. We'll do one more 
time higher speed driving here on the German Autobahn after that tunnel again. One thing I do notice while driving is definitely once again the seating position which is a little bit awkward in the EV version. It's definitely to me because of the higher seating position less comfortable than the ICE brother also while driving and indeed it does irritate me while driving that I'm so close to the ceiling here with my head so I would definitely stick with the combustion engine version of this G80 as for the seating comfort at my height. Maybe if you're not as tall as me, it might not be such a problem. You won't notice it that much or you might think, hey, maybe it's even good that I'm sitting a little bit higher. But for tall people, not an idea. When we're already at speed, 80 kilometers an hour, how does the car behave in acceleration? Let's go. Oh, strong. 130, 150, 170, 180, yeah, it's really cool, and then let's switch the lane, yeah, it doesn't give me the best feeling of the vehicle, I mean, we are at really high speeds here, but wow, super sided here, although almost, again, 200 kilometers an hour, 125 miles an hour, that is very well done, and it's very comfortable, just not that sporty, and that's fine, you know, but... We're testing here the vehicles that you actually know what to expect. And I have to say the EQE is sportier in the driving suspension wise and so on, better steering feel, but the seats in the EQE are also not that good actually. But I must say the combustion engine seats here of the G80 are even better. Here with the G8 is definitely the big advantage when you are driving here also at higher speeds and would burn a lot of energy. Then we can also better do quick charging from this 10 to 80% in about 21, 22 minutes. Yes, the Mercedes EQ is also good in that one, so they are both good in that respect here. Here with the a volt technology, of course, they are also you know really top of the game. No one can beat them at the moment at this, at this point. Well. Porsche Taycan and the Audi e-tron GT, of course, they have also the 800 volt technology. These are the only two ones besides the you know, Hyundai Kia Genesis. So we know that the Kia EV6 has that and the Hyundai Ioniq 5 and the Genesis GV60. That's the EV, the corresponding model. And then here also the Genesis G80 and the Genesis GV60. The SUV is then the GV70 EV, right? Yeah, that one will also get it. So, yeah, really good this 8 volt technology. Let's go back to the normal driving mode, comfort mode. Here now, countryside roads. You can also test something of the assistant systems. You've heard and seen, maybe also seen, there's a red tr uh, triangle then in the side mirror when you have the blind spot monitor activated. You also heard that um, when I was in between the two motorway segments. The Adaptive cruise control works well to keep the distance to the car in front of me. The active steering assist I tested earlier in a construction site on the motorway, which is the fiercest test basically, and it's not it's not bad, but it's also not that convincing. I also activated here now on the countryside road. On the motorway, most of the systems work well, but when they're in harder conditions, like here, this corner here now, you see, I'm not steering, it does fall, but yeah, it fails, kind of, you know, it steers a little bit, but it's not really keeping the lane and very good active lane keeping systems. They usually also keep this lane here very well, even though we're not on the motorway. So do not trust 100% in this active lane keeping assist here. Overall, what I really do like while driving is the direct user interface when I'm, you know, a little bit colder or too hot or something. Um, yeah, I hope usually I'm too hot, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, in, in, in both ways, yeah. Um, so here, uh, I can easily control that here with the climate unit. So no hashtag capacitive BS, nor on the steering wheel, nor on the climate unit. Well, here's the touchscreen for the vent strength, but I can live with that. And it's also rather straightforward. It stays in the same direction, also with the heated steering wheel, for example, or the cool seats. That's really a great thing to have. So I really like the classic user face of this vehicle. Besides infotainment system-wise, I mean, 
it's not meant to be touched. Like you see, it's here like a so rather they want you to use that lower turning knob and I told you earlier mm, they did it in a way that it's differentiating from the shifting lever that you don't mess that up but the GV60 also has a different solution for that now so the problem is that turning that thing with its really flat DJ knob like it's not ideal while driving and then pressing it so the um, the control interface for that should just be the classic one like these Audi MMIs or BMW iDrive selector and so on. Um, this would be a, a way easier solution overall here also for this vehicle. Countryside road here now, super silent, so I really like it. And the effect of this vacuum effect from the active noise cancellation, I think it's okay. I, I, I'm, I think I'm noticing it a little bit, but not too much. But I'm really a fan always of passive noise insulation. Speaks more for build quality. And this active noise cancellation, yeah, in the plane with, ear, with, with, with headphones, I think it's okay because it filters, you know, this specific um, uh, wavelength also that appears in the plane. Some rattling, rattling now from the console here. Mm -hmm. um, but here in, in vehicles, not the biggest fan of it, to be honest. What do you think about the small small e-scooters e on roads, by the way? I tend to think that it's really dangerous, you know? They are not going that fast. They are easily overseen, especially when it's a little bit darker. Um, some of them even have don't have light. Yeah, and a lot of people are crashing with these, right? Uh, it's because they have, like a, like a bicycle has like this gyro effect when you, you know, start applying, uh, you know, start applying speed. Wheels, big wheels are turning and they're just going straight, you know, even if you would take hands off or if you decelerate, bicycle just goes in a way, you know, because of this gyroscopic effect. But these very small e-scooters, when you don't hold them tight, they crash the teammate directly. Yeah, well, let's go back to the cars. They are safer and bigger. Four wheels on the ground. That's, of course, always a good thing to have. And talking about four wheels, this one here equipped with all-wheel drive because we have one electric motor in the front one electric motor in the rear and the distribution here is actually quite equal so most of the time you have them a 50 50 distribution that means it doesn't have any bias as for front or rear wheel that's also an interesting thing so also when we accelerate it quite likable you also i'm mean, not sure if you've seen it on camera earlier when we did the acceleration it was really like going like a boat you know um very interesting because the suspension is so soft. Recuperation, regenerative braking. I know that technically there is, when you're going deep in the tech, there is a difference. Um, to be honest, I read it like five times and I still didn't get the real difference between recuperation and regenerative braking. I can just say that in the whole automotive industry, um, everyone is using it as a synonym. And just saying like, okay, it is exactly, that is close. Um, and saying it's exactly the same. And yeah, maybe if, uh, you know, uh, if you are like a tech geek uh, and know more about this, you can explain it in the comments to us. What is the real difference to that? Because I've, you know, most of the time I heard everyone talking it as a synonym, like recuperation equals regenerative braking. In this case here, let's concentrate on the car features. You can set it on the shifting pedals. So... You can go with um, auto mode when you press and hold these pedals, for example, and then actually the car decides for itself. For example, when a car is in front of you, then some recuperation is happening, and when it's free ray, then it's rather rolling. But you can also use the um, you know the individual modes. So, for example, I pedal here. I pedal means I lift my foot off the throttle, and you have strong deceleration. That is one pedal driving, indeed. It is cancelled again at the next startup of the vehicle because again they the manufacturers do these testing cycles for the consumption and then they have to decide if they go one pedal driving or not and you can also set it a little bit lower that they have strong recuperation but not this i pedal or even less another step and another step and then the car is whoo, whoo, just rolling and doing the regenerative braking that's a new traffic light doing the regenerative braking just by the brake pedal. It will not have a difference on the amount of energy that you gain back. 
It's just a different method of doing that if you use the brake pedal or if you do let the, the car do it itself um, by lifting your foot off the throttle. And it is really a very tough decision or what, what, what can I tell you what is the best thing because if we split in three methods, one pedal driving feeling, automatic mode, like this adaptive recuperation, and rolling and using the brake pedal. Every mode has its pros and cons. The eye pedal or one pedal driving feeling has the advantage, it's in a way comfortable because most of the time you do not use the brake pedal anymore. And also when you lift your foot off the throttle, you already gain back some energy, you are already decelerating. That can also be a safety thing when you switch your foot from one pedal to another. Negative side, a lot of G-force on the passengers if you're not used to drive it, drive it um, because you might apply too much throttle and too much brake and so on, um, especially for the co-drivers and so on. Then on the other side, the rolling effect can be dangerous because you lift your foot off the throttle, there's no engine brake, the car is just rolling, it takes time that you switch to the brake pedal. Um, you might get too fast then. On the other hand, it's comfortable because it doesn't apply G-force that fast and you can finally tune the deceleration then with the brake pedal. And the adaptive one in between has the advantage that sometimes you know you don't have to do the things yourself, there's a car in front of you, there's, there's no recuperation, it's good, way it's free, it's rolling, that's fine. So that could be the best compromise. But yet again, there is this very important aspect of predictability so that you know at any point what is my vehicle going to do right now? And this is also a crucial thing. And I also, I mean, oh no, in a way I like the adaptive recuperation. And in another way, I think I also like predictability. I like to know, you know, at which torque basically is my vehicle reacting when I lift my foot off the throttle. That's, you know, because this adaptive recuperation is a little bit like adaptive cruise control. Or if you think about a combustion engine, if the engine brake would, would always vary. Yes, it does, depending on the gear selection, you know, for example. Hmm, tough thing to do. And so at this moment, yeah, that's the thing that it is indeed changing throughout my electric vehicle testing life. Sometimes I think, yeah, I think I'm, I'm with one pedal driving. The other moment I think I'm with adaptive recuperation. And then I think again, yeah, maybe it's not predictable enough. Maybe a um, different way is better. So, I mean, usually when I'm testing cars, there are certain factors I'm always sure of. For example, I don't like hashtag capacitive BS. I like to have physical knobs. And this will remain, you know, my whole car testing life. I'm very certain about that, you know. Um, yeah, but, but this, you know, with the EV recuperation, it's really a thing you can argue about which is the best thing. Um, I'm not exactly sure about that. At this moment, I think it could also be, you know, when, when I set it to a slight recuperation, then I'm not exactly in the one pedal driving feeling. I need to use the brake at some point. There is some deceleration happening when I lift my foot off the throttle. So, because most of the time when you lift your foot off the throttle, you want some deceleration, but maybe not the strongest one. Not in an adaptive way, because that's not predictable enough what the car is doing. So at this moment, I feel most, most comfortable with a little recuperation, because that, you know, that's given me the comfort that's, that most of the time I won't need the brake pedal. But if I need stronger braking, then I do use the brake pedal. That's also what you're used to from combustion engine cars. And at the same time, I always know how strong the recuperation is because it's predict predictable. It's always in the same strength. And for this could be level one or level two of the deceleration. And then you're actually fine. So this is my standpoint at this moment. Yeah, would like to hear your opinion what fan are you of in driving these one pedal driving feeling always strong recuperation no recuperation via throttle pedal or energy pedal at all you just use the brakes or this adaptive solution in between or then my recent solution a little recuperation to find a compromise there that is still predictable very very interesting that whole discussion isn't it 
What else is missing here in this driving part is the agile driving. We're going in some winding corners. We know that this is not the expert thing of this vehicle. Still, we want to find out more about that. Once again, then in the sports mode and see how it handles the very narrow corners. Here we go, sports mode once again. Wow, yeah, strong acceleration always. Hard to see and also here with the shadows, always have to pay attention. Yeah, that A pillar is also quite thick to see. Now here you have to see I have to steer a lot with this vehicle. Yeah, this acceleration out of the corner is super, super strong. Left and right slalom. Yeah, the suspension doesn't shake up too much. It's more like this front back roll that is stronger than the other one. Yeah, I have to steer a lot. That makes it also less agile, but out of the corners is beautiful indeed. So what's going on there? So um, like when you, why are these guys stopping in the middle of the road? So accelerating out is really a good thing to have. That's a truck. Interesting. So um, this is really a nice agility factor of this vehicle when you are even in these you know narrow corners that you accelerate out and you immediately have a great boost. Hmm. Never seen a truck on this track here. So here once again, bam! Yeah, that's really nice. Here also in this S combination. Yeah, and here also, I wouldn't have expected that. So. At high speeds, there was more body roll and so on. And usually you would expect that the agile corner is an even less fun, but I have to say, this vehicle here, although it's so large and has a turning circle of a tractor like 12 meters, it's surprisingly fun in these narrow corners. Hmm, interesting finding for today indeed. So that low center of gravity then with the battery pack underneath, that did cause us headroom helps here in the agile performance. So as I said initially, with the BMW 7 Series and the Genesis G80, the overall vehicle, they are basically identical, just that with the G80 EV, you have actually less headroom in the front driver's seat. That is a very crucial difference. And to me, as a tall person, it would basically rule out the EV for that reason. Hmm. So I would not live with that. With the BMW 7 Series, front driver's seat, space, overall and so on, is the same between the internal combustion engine version and the BMW i7. And with the Mercedes S-Class, yeah, there the EQS is really very, very different. And I think that the EQS is just design was not on top of the game. And especially if you compare S-Class versus EQS, I mean, would you pick or prefer the EQS instead of the S-Class, just design-wise. So I think, especially from the exterior, this is a problem, of course, all accounted for aerodynamics. Yes, the EQS is the most aerodynamic one then here. That is always about pro and con. What they all have in common is that the electric versions drive very, very well. You have more weight on the one hand, but then the center of gravity is low battery is in the very lower part of the vehicle and that's why the driving experience is also really good and of course also a very instantaneous acceleration from the electric drivetrain so at the same time it's also very sporty so especially with 7 series versus i7 i really struggled to find out which one is more fun the internal combustion engine or the electric version both drive very well and are a lot of fun to drive so it's not about this decision actually especially with the bmw it's more about which concept do you prefer and do you have the fitting charging infrastructure and how is your driving profile so if you have a good charging infrastructure you can charge at home and you have good fast charging stations on your way also for example you don't have to drive too long hours every single day and, you know, the electric version is just fine. With the S-Class versus the EQS, it's not only about that. Especially the rear seating comfort is so much worse in the EQS. Here, the S-Class is really more luxury than the EQS. With the G80 and G80 EV, 
Yeah, that was the thing about the front driver's seat, so this is a crucial difference. It will not affect small drivers so much. So basically, to me, it would be A, charging infrastructure, B, driving profile, but then really take a look at these vehicles. Once again, with the BMW, it doesn't make any difference. S-Class EQS, huge difference. They are really would prefer the S-Class from the overall vehicle standpoint. And with the Genesis, yeah, that's the thing. Are you a tall driver or not? Is that really a relevant thing then for you? All of them are really great vehicles, no doubt about that. So with BMW, I wouldn't care if it's the ICE version or the electric version, just depends on the infrastructure. S-Class versus EQS, I would definitely go for the S-Class. Genesis G80 versus the EV version, I would also go for the internal combustion engine because I'm a tall driver. And then if we all put them together in one pot, it would be the BMW 7 Series or the i7 for me because they offer non-animal skin seating and it drives very well and has the best seat ergonomics actually. This is my verdict for today. What do you think? Tell me in the comments and join us for more comparison episodes.